The broadcast is now starting. All attending call in listen only mode. Good morning and welcome to the City Council meeting held today, April 27th, 2023. Councilman Carlson, do you have invocation? Yes, sir. I'd like to um, welcome Ra Rabbi Michael Weiss is the assistant rabbi at Congregation Sherazetic. He was ordained as a rabbi from Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati in May of 2020 after having served as a student rabbi in Richmond, Indiana and Sioux Falls, South Dakota and, and as rabbinic intern at Rockdale Temple in uh, Cincinnati. Having been ordained during the pandemic, Rabbi Weiss has worked hard to find creative ways to use technology to connect with people in learning and prayer. Rabbi Weiss is uh, deeply committed to accompanying people on their Jewish journeys and inspiring a love of prayer, study, and acts of kindness and justice. Uh, so Rabbi, if you please uh, give the invocation, we'll all stand and then do the Pledge of Allegiance after. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, it is an honor to be here. One of Judaism's holiest prayers is called the Shema. It is our declaration of faith. Hear, O Israel, Adonai is our God, Adonai is one. Traditionally, its recitation is strictly mandated by Jewish law twice a day in the morning and evening. But as with many things, there's a story that dares us to question this norm. We are told Rabbi Yehuda was once walking behind his teachers, Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Elazar ben Azariah. The sun began to rise, and so the time to recite the Shema had arrived. But Rabbi Yehuda saw that neither of his teachers stopped their conversation. They continued walking and talking even as their religious duties were pressing. He sped up to catch them and said, my teachers, it is time to recite the Shema. Should we not pause? The two rabbis then turned to him and told him to leave them alone because they were busy discussing the needs of the community. What does this teach us? That even our most important obligations, even those obligations to God, take a back seat to ensuring that we provide for the needs of our community to tackling the very real problems that our people face. What you do in here is holy work, and our people have put their sacred trust in you. And so I will offer a blessing from our tradition for those who, night and day, put the needs of your neighbors first. Baruch Ata Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Asher Kiddushanu B'mitzvotav V'tzivanu, La'asok B'tzorki Tzibor, how full of blessing you are, eternal one, our God, majesty of the universe, who has given us pathways to holiness and commanded us to occupy ourselves with the needs of the community. May God be with you and support you all the days of your service. And may you see the divine presence in all of the people that you serve. And we can say together, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Roll call. Carlson? Here. Vieira? Maniscalco? Here. Hurtek? Here. Goods? Here. Miranda? Here. Citro? Here. We have physical quorum. Thank you. Councilman Carlson, we have some special guests with us today. Yes, I just want to thank you, sir. I just want to uh, thank. Um, uh, Josh Bergen and Travis Horn for bringing a delegation from Romania. Would the, our Romanian guests please stand up? Um, we have business leaders and a uh, sitting member of parliament, a sitting uh, city council member, and, and uh, minister of trade, several other uh, key folks from Romania. Um, I've been to R Romania briefly, beautiful country, lots of great eco potential economic ties with uh, Tampa. So I want to welcome you all here. They're going to sit in for a few minutes and then leave. Um, uh, I asked them to stay in particular for public comment, which is always a good time to hear um, our version of democracy. <laughs> so thank you all for visiting. Yes, thank you for being here. Thank you for uh, sharing your morning with us. We will move on to uh, public comment. 
If you wish to speak at this time for public comment, please approach the podium, state your name, and you will be given three minutes to speak. Before you Hello. speak, let me just let everybody know that today is your birthday, and we wish you a very happy birthday. <laughs> Hello, I'm Sally Issy Lee with the Volunteer Missionary Society, and I just want to share a few words with you. Um, the Black Business Tour was a great, splintavious African American cultural festival. Black Women United. We had a wonderful day. We went to the West Shore O, oh, and thank you, Ms. Candid Lowe and company. Thank you for all the great achievements and opportunity to participate in the economic enterprise. At the end of the boss store, I made my homeless rounds after we got to Tampa Plaza to the bookstore. Um, and I was over there talking to the homeless, and they was telling me about um, resources, and places for homeless people to go to get help. So St. Peter at Clay Street, and we thank God for uh, all the followers, followers of God willing to lend a hand to the poor for a hot meal and other resources. And the last day of services, I went, took a walk across the bridge and ran into this holiness church from Lutz and they were out helping, and the power of God just fell on us, and we just had a good time. And so, I'm gonna make this brief. I went to uh, the CDC last evening uh, to the we, Be we Mean Business Workshop, looking for housing information, and they invited me and so I, the cab and I had a few words, so he hung up and by then it was dark. And there was five guys coming at me. And out of nowhere, uh, a sheriff deputy rolled up right where I was walking in the dark. And I saw they had fear because they was coming, which I didn't have but $2 just for the bus. And when I was walking in the dark, I noticed all the women out there that are trying to get home from work. And there was not one, no kind of public safety person in sight. And it was really a bad feeling for women trying to get home out of the dark, sleeping in bushes my age and on the back porches of businesses. And I just want to say that um, women in the dark, but, and we need uh, prayer in school and not guns. And I just thank God for my life today. And I didn't get to finish, but the ball is now in the hands. I'm waiting on Chief Bennett and his associate, Gwen Miller. And I hope he don't forget about me, because this center is much needed to help women get referrals, find out about uh, resources. And I just thank God for my life and I hope he don't forget me. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, Keela McCaskill. I wanna say congratulations to all of you. Um, for those of you that are leaving and those of you that are uh, reappointed to your roles. Um, I ponder for weeks, uh, what do you say to uh, one of the leaving city council members for, for the dedication, the hard work, the commitment, the sacrifices that they've made in their role as a city council member? You know, it was, it was some of you that rest re restored my belief in, in, you know, coming through to the elected officials to make some things happen. Um, some of you make sacrifices, and I know they say not to say their names, but sometimes they do so much. You know, Councilman Carlson spends his own money and resources to touch, get the temperature in the community. Two times throughout the month, you're going to see, or actually four times if you go to one of the events, and then the other one is something separate. You know, Councilman 
uh, council member, councilwoman Lynn Hertek, all that you do, uh, Councilman Vieira, you've done a lot. We, uh, all of you have done so much. And then Councilman Goods, you know, you've done the sacrifices. People are able, you, you've done so much and been so many things for so many people. And so I pondered, what do you say? How do you say, what do you say? What do you say to them as they exit? And, and the only thing I could come up with genuinely is that you say thank you. You continuously, we overwhelm you with thanks and, and gratitude and we, we articulate it verbally. We do it publicly. We do it individually. We do it as much as we can because you all don't hear it enough. So for all of you, I say thank you, but specifically to you, I say thank you. Heartfelt thank you. And then I want to know what do you do? because I don't think we do enough. I don't think we do enough for those that sacrifice their lives and they spend their time, their money, their resources, and they're dedicated to the role that you've signed up for. We voted you in. You all have definitely performed to, to, to at least the satisfaction. And so what do we do? Now after 5, five o'clock today, we cannot give you gifts because most of you won't even accept a cup of coffee, not even a bottle of water. But to, after the day, after 5 o'clock, we get to shower you with gifts. I've received some. I've received cards from the community that they're saying they want to toast to you on success on your four-year journey here. You've left so much seed in the ground, and it'll grow and develop as you, you receive fit. And the only thing we could do is be do a better job of trying to be a unified community to do more for the district that you worked so hard for. So again, to all of you, thank you, Councilman Goods. We're saying a farewell. We have total success after five today. I guess we can give, give you those gifts. So thank you so much. Council, if I may, I, forgive me for interrupting. Uh, I just want to make it clear for the, the, uh, the audience um, to bring to your attention, just so you know, um, that uh, at 5 o'clock today, you'll still be in office. <laughs> After 5 o'clock today, you'll still be in office, and uh, your term does not end until midnight on, the, on April 30th. So I just want to bring that to your attention. And, and in case there's any misunderstandings, uh, I just want to bring it to the public's attention. And I, uh, I again, apologize for interrupting. Uh, good morning, Connie Burton. It's always something with the prayer that always tie into what I want to say. And if this is, you know, holy work, congratulations to all that has been willing to serve and to keep on serving, whether you're there or not. But I do want to bring to your attention the resolution that you signed in 2020. You, the council, with the exception of Ms. Lynn Hertek, said that you understood the past harm that had been done to the African American community based on past and present. We have the profound dis disparities that continue to exist in our community. And in that resolution, you talked about declaring the creation of a reconciliation commission now that was in 2020, and now we're in 2023. And the issues are still here. The issues of how do we show our young people in our community that a better temper is meant for them. On, one, on some simple things that we have asked for in our CRA, with the CRA funding that we allow our children to be able to see the benefit of not just work, entrepreneurship, having a better relationship with the city of Tampa, and the resistance that we are getting constantly is to answer no. Not that we are asking the city staff to do any of it. The CRA has money. They can hire a mentor to help navigate. So children in our community that is always deemed to not having hope Hope can be breathed into them. I believe that such a commission would be able to help you understand that it just can't be mere words of how we deal with disparity and ongoing past neglect, but then we'll be able to have a framework, a measurement. It's not enough to say that you're improving minority participation and then we have small scales of measurements of maybe four to five percent on different projects. The disparity is real in our community. We have asked continuously that we be able to use the resources in our community so we can improve the lives of our senior. East Tampa CRA was the first, and yet it lags behind as the last. We want to see a change in all of this. It's not going to go away. 
The request is not going to go away. Either your resolution that you signed in 2020 was meaningful or uh, it was not. Thank you. Good morning, Good morning, Natasha Goodley. This is bittersweet. The past four years have been very much so bittersweet. For once, I felt as though East Tampa had a voice. Everyone talks about East Tampa and uses East Tampa to get elected, but then does nothing for us. We gained a voice in Councilman Goods. We had someone who called out the inequalities in the city. We had someone who stopped the budget to mandate that East Tampa have a share in the funding. We had someone fight to give us a rescue car, community center, apprenticeship programs, things that seem just regular, a voice. East Tampa has been neglected for decades and has been repeatedly said on council. And it wasn't happenstance. Calculated institutional racism from as far as the federal government to as low as the city had a hand in all of this. East Tampa didn't get here overnight, and it'll take much calculated effort to get us out of it. And that's what Con Councilman Goods fought to do. I'm embarrassed at the shenanigans we've witnessed in this city. From Councilman Dingfelder, to Councilman Goods, to Councilman Carlson, to Councilwoman Hurtak. It's embarrassing to have witnessed this. And although the other council members haven't said so, deep down I know you're afraid. Afraid the same thing could happen to you. So instead of fighting against the injustices, you've gone along with it. How will we ever move this city in a positive direction for everyone if those with the power to affect change are scared? I chaired the CRA for two years and endured all types of constant harassment, and all council ever did was applaud my efforts and thank me for fighting for the people in spite of the harassment. Yet you all have the power to actually affect change for the people in spite of the harassment, but you've chosen not to. So what will happen to our city if everyone who can make a difference chooses not to. Councilman Goods, thank you for everything. You fought a good fight. Keep your head up, brother. The judge vindicated you twice. And anyone who publicly condemned you owes you a public apology. God makes no mistakes. And what is for you is for you. And no man or woman can take it from you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Bishop Michelle B. Patty, the pastor of Trinity and Faith Ministry. I'm also the host of What's Really Happening, along with Jay Johnson and King Cobra. And I'm also the owner of Michelle B. Patty Auto Accident Referral Service. I'd like to say congratulations to you all, those that are sitting here. And I have a different perspective. I don't think anyone would want to be elected that's afraid to serve the people. You have shown that you uh, stand up when it's time to stand up. We're looking for unity. We're looking for people to come together and make a difference, to stop the cliquish uh, attitudes that I've seen before. I'm very hopeful that we're going to be moving not only uh, downtown, but East Tampa is going to start getting its fair share because I know many of your hearts. I've spoken to you all. I, some of you know black history more than some of these people who come up every week and badger you. So I'm asking that you all be diligent, that you say and mean what you said while you was on that campaign trail. And Councilman Joseph Citro, we want to say thank you so much for all the hard work that you've done. We also have gifts for you. We appreciate you. We appreciate your loyalty. We appreciate the support that you've given this community, whether people received it or not. You've always had a smile on your face. You showed up when people called you. Even when we didn't call you, you were out in the community. So whatever your endeavor as you move forward, I know that God has his anointing on it, and you're going to be very successful. And to the rest of you all, let's get to work. Amen. Thank you. Good morning, Council Chair, Chair um, Councilwoman. Allison Hewitt, 4904 32nd Street, East Tampa. I um, want to say uh, thank you uh, to Councilman Goods, especially um, this being his last um, meeting here. Gentrification and the potential gentrification of East Tampa is on the table. And then Councilman Dean Felder and Councilman Goods asked for outside of the box thinking on how we can mitigate it because change is coming. 
We just need to do things that will protect the people who blood, sweat, and tears for years and generations have invested in East Tampa. And so I want to thank Councilman Goose for proposing the pre-development program and thank each one of you for your support of it. I am so excited with the potential projects that you will see for a generation of landowners and property owners who will bring forth a way to be able to participate in this incredible growth in Tampa. So thank you for that. I um, would also like to thank you to understand that Councilman Goods every day, whether it was the car dealership or the car repair shop or the corner store, um, those people didn't really know what city council was until he came in their shops. He made sure that he talked to them to find out what was happening with them. Many of them did not last through COVID. And so he has worked with the local banks to really create some um, proper, um, programs, some, um, how do I say it, uh, line of credit with the banks for businesses who contract with the city of Tampa. Because he understood that a lot of those folks, they pay their people before they pay themselves. That they make sure that the people who come to work every day have food on the table and they're just hustling and having side jobs. So I want to thank you for looking out for the small business owner as well. And East Tampa, and especially with the East Tampa CRA, we are going to um, need the full force of the CRA as we're moving forward. We are about to update our CRP, and I am hoping that at uh, this time, since you will have a part of that, that you are really looking to the economic development aspects of it. When you ask a community who needs street lights, who needs security, who needs sidewalks, what they want to see in their community, that's what they're going to tell you. But you understand that we also want to make sure that we look like the channel side and we look like the downtown and we're having the economic development opportunity that will spring generations of wealth and business owners. And so I ask you that as you are contemplating how to move East Tampa forward, that we don't get bo bogged down in the emotions and we're looking at the real economic growth in East Tampa. Thank you. Thank you. Mentezna, I want to say Uhuru. Uhuru means freedom in Swahili. And I want to say, like, you know, you hear people here talking about East Tampa. It ain't no more East Tampa. It ain't no West Tampa. It ain't no Central Park. It ain't no old Yeboy City. It ain't none of that. It ain't no more Progress Village. It ain't no more Carver City and Lincoln Gardens. They pushing all the Africans out the city. They trying to build a stadium over there, and they pushing all the Africans out of the city, plain and simple. So African people coming down here begging, 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 they're on the wrong track. African people voting out of their mind. A city or a county with a million registered voters and like 19, 20,000 people voted. Nobody participated in that. Democracy, that word democracy is subjugation for African people. It's always been that, 623 years of that. 623 years of that. And the, the ignorant stuff of getting my mailbox, Every single day, some high school trash with people with elongated faces and all that, don't vote for this person, what they did, what they did. That democracy, you should be ashamed of it. Any black person voting out of their mind, unless we're voting for reparations, unless African people are voting for reparations, we ain't got to be coming down here begging every week. We don't have to be begging every week, oh, give us this, give us a park, give us a speed bump, give us a roundabout. African people don't have to be doing that. You understand? African people really need to get united because we've got two strong sisters right here, Sister Michelle and Sister Connie. We've got two strong sisters right here that if they got united, we can really see some changes in this city. Not the stuff they've been promising us, put your lottery ticket in a bucket and get pulled to see if you get housing and waiting on HUD and all this nonsense. No, we want real changes. That's what we want. African people don't have access to anything. And I'm going to say this. I'm going to show this. This is some information that I have from the Florida Supreme Court. They say a case that I tried to appeal to the Florida Supreme Court said I couldn't have filed it. I hadn't been down here for three weeks because what? It's an outstanding warrant for my arrest. Why? The main problem black people have, child support. Child support. White people trying to tell us how to run our lives, have no legal representation, and they dogging you out. Most black men... Most black families, most African families getting dogged out in that child support administrative hearing process. Judge Figueroa, who's been right to this podium at the head of it, 
is at the head of it. The help African people need, we don't have to beg for that help. We have to organize for that help. And that's what the African people need to do. We don't need to come down here every week begging white folks, oh, give us this, give us that. We're not from a beggar's race. All that skin color discrimination they're doing is live and it's well. We don't have to beg for anything. You got to beg for a cemetery, for them to clean the cemetery and all this nonsense. Over with. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Yes. Mr. Chairman, Council Members, my name is Liliana yeah. Filip. I'm representing the Romanian group here. Uh, thank you for the warm welcome and special thanks to Councilman Bill Carson for having us. And uh, we are here to learn from you and your community spirit is amazing and inspire us. Thank you so much. We have much to learn from you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Stephanie Pointer, I'm citizen of Tampa, and I'm also a budget committee member. Um, I, I'm just cheap. And I'm wondering why today we went out of order, because public comment usually comes after commendations. And we have at least 10 folks here in their uniforms who could be working by now had we done it in the normal order, I'm just saying. Um, so if we're going to change things up, somebody should let somebody know. Uh, Councilman Goods, Councilman uh, Citro, good luck with all your future uh, endeavors. We're going to miss you. Um, Councilman Goods, I appreciate that you have stood up on every single opportunity for your community. I'd like to remind everybody here that um, these folks have come here today and asked for development in East Tampa. I'm going to stand up here and tell you we don't need any more development south of Gandy. So when folks are coming to me, I'm going to ask them to go visit my friends in East Tampa because it's time for us to get development where we want it, where the citizens need it, not where it is putting our community in jeopardy. And honestly, twice this week, Inner Bay between Manhattan and Dale Mabry have been completely backed up. We're talking three or four lights, and we have thousands of units still coming. So when somebody comes to you and says, I want to build this in South Tampa, in SOG, it's time to start redirecting them to some place that's more appropriate for that kind of density, because we're full. And we haven't even gotten finished with what you guys have approved over time. This council has been very supportive of the neighborhoods in South Gandy, and we appreciate that. But please remember when they come back to you, South Tampa's full. Thank you. Have a good day. Good morning, council. Tony Huffman with BND Towing. Sir, if I can just stop you just for a minute. Um, I just want to be clear before we do that, and forgive me for doing this, but um, I just want to, uh, and I'm passing this around to City Council. I, I, I believe, sir, are you here intending to speak on item number two? I am, sir. Okay. Um, let me then, um, if I can, uh, bring to Council's attention and your attention as well, um, with regard to that item, in a memo dated April 18th, of 2023, um, uh, the uh, city attorney's office, the legal department, uh, forwarded a memo to city council uh, reminding the city council about the RFP solicitation period and it has been published with regard to the, um, the towing um, contract. And I just want to bring to your attention, sir, and I have a copy of the letter if you wish to see it, the memo, um, that communication during the pendency of solicitation, just a reminder to city council, during any solicitation period, including any protest and or appeal, no contact with city officers or employees other than the individuals speci specifically identified in the solicitation, the director of the soliciting department or the legal department, is permitted from any bidder or proposer. Such communication shall result in an automatic disqualification for the selection in the pending solicitation and any subsequent city solicitations for a period of six months no matter the outcome of the solicitation or any protest and or appeal. So, sir, what I'm suggesting to you is uh, if you do wish to discuss this uh, pursuant to this city code, it could affect your ability to participate in the solicitation process. 
and uh, I, I, I would appreciate it. I just Mr. Chairman, point of order. Councilman Goods. Mr. Uh, uh, Massey, I'm confused. Uh, this was supposed to be a workshop to talk about the issues with the towing company, and I didn't know RFP was already done again. And so I think that's unfair to the tow truck drivers and the community to not be able to discuss the issue of their concerns because that's what I thought this workshop was going to be about, to discuss their concerns to, some, to find some type of resolution versus an RFP. Um, Mr. Schmidt, who wrote the memo, is not here today, but my understanding is that because of the, uh, the movement of the current impound lot, the city impound lot, is going, it's being redeveloped as we speak, timing-wise, the RFP had to be reissued. There was a meeting with all the tow companies, with the TPD and purchasing before the new RFP was issued to try to address the concerns of the tow companies. My understanding was that, that, was, that this solicitation was, did address that, most of those issues. But that's it. I, I had a conversation with this man. I told him that, you know, I felt that uh, after looking at all the aspects of the new impound lot, this council got bamboozled. That place is too small. Uh, when, I, when I talked to Sal, I, we were assured this was going to be a sufficient place for the impounds, for evidence and everything. And now to come down in the ninth hour and now say it's not uh, sufficient enough now, to me, we, we wasted taxpayers' dollars. Because we, 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 we were assured, and that's what I was, when I went out there and took a walk through, I was assured this is the perfect place because you had an inside shelter, you had an outside, and for me to see, even though I'm leaving today, to see that the community can't talk about this, I think it's wrong. But I yield back to the chairman. I will go with Councilman Miranda, then Councilman Woodward. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, yeah, I saw another point in my eye. Some months ago, I'd heard a rumor that this was happening. I didn't know exactly what it was. I started digging around, and then I was told that it was because of the impound lot that we were going to move the cars out and do something there other than the impound lot. However, we forget one thing, and you've heard me say many times, and I'm not speaking to you directly, uh, Mr. Council, uh, Mr. Massey, I'm, I'm speaking in general terms. When we forget, and I say something, what if, and the what if in my mind is always what if this happens and what happens here. We didn't calculate that there was over, I think there's 30 or 32 individuals in the line of the rotation. I'm not sure how it works, but I know it's somewhere in that number. And no one thought of them because the individuals, and I did, I did dial up one anonymously and I talked to that individual months back. And he told me he had just bought a wrecker. He has a small lot, but his payments on the wrecker and if he loses this, he won't have any income coming in. Not all of it, about 45% or 50%, he told me. That would not be enough to cover his overhead on the equipment that he bought. And, and this is not you, a reflection of Mr. Massey at all. This is on a system that didn't look at the what if. And there's, I, I, here again, I want to repeat that, 30 or 32 small businesses, that's what they are, they're not huge and they're not, they don't have the capacity others have they're trying to do better. They're trying to do better for their family and get their kids educated so they don't have to be tow truck drivers. Not that there's something wrong with it. But you got to work day and night. That's what's wrong with it. And when you have those things in mind, this is something that uh, it's hard to swallow. Uh, even though we talk about helping the small businesses, what if these 30 some companies get together and buy a lot somewhere, an acre or two acres, whatever it's at, outside the perimeter of the city because you're not going to find that land that's reasonable in the city. And they can create their own lot. But we never gave that opportunity because we never thought of the what if. And the what if is that if we go this way, the what if, there's just 30 some companies there that we talk about small businesses will not be able to facilitate what they've been doing on a pretty constant basis. And I would say on a pretty good basis that they deliver what the goods are. No matter what time of day or night, your rotation comes up, you're the one that's got to show. And I'm not here to argue about the, the RFP. I'm not speaking directly to the RFP. I'm going around in circles, so I don't insult anyone. But if I have to insult someone, I will. So I would ask you to be careful because I'm not, I'm not too happy today. When I see this, I don't know if you had a meeting with them. I don't know anything. Mr. Hold on, just a, a couple of things. I think Ms. Newcomb would like to address you, but the scope of the RFP has changed dramatically 
And I think you're going to hear from this gentleman that they're okay with the RFP as is issued. Well, so. We don't know that. May I, may, may I, if I can, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just want to direct council's attention to the motion for item two today. And I will read it for the public, but you have it in front of you. And I, I, do you want to speak first? Because I'd like to be able to address Council that. Councilwoman Hertak is recognized. There should be no RFP already out. Th this is very clear what we asked for. We asked, Councilman Goods and Maniscalco asked that the report include financial background as to why this is a good, good idea to privatize instead of keep it in-house with numbers attached to the report. Further, that said report be back, brought back April 27, 2023 workshop session. There should, no be, there should not be an RFP right now. I certainly will not approve an RFP that comes in front of me until we have this discussion. The discussion was whether or not this is even prudent for us to be spending money on. And an RFP was put out before council could even think about whether or not they wanted to do it. That's the part that I believe Councilman Goods is upset about. That's what I'm really angry about because I thought we were going to have a great conversation today about why it's a good idea to privatize. I'm not even to the RFP yet. I want to know why it's a good idea monetarily to privatize something whose costs will only increase over time. I have not been convinced. I don't think anyone here has been convinced. Um, I have no problem with keeping our tow companies in the rotation, but why are we even talking about this? This has not been discussed by us, and I'm just very upset that this RFP has gone on and we have not talked about whether or not this is a good idea for the city and for and fiscal responsibility. Shelby. Yes, getting back to that and following up with your comments and the comments of, the, of Councilman Goods and, and Councilman, um, uh, Councilman Miranda, it does say specifically on, the, on, your, on your agenda today, staff to bring back information pertaining to the tow company situation, comma, before the RFP or anything moves forward for the tow company. And it goes on to state. So uh, getting back to Councilmember Miranda's what if, the reason I brought this to your attention is this was brought to my attention. I don't know whether council was aware that an RFP had been issued contrary to council's memo, excuse me, to council's motion. I don't know the answer to that. But with regard to what if, if the reason that this was issued because it was time was of the essence, the question is then, what if council rejects the contract when it comes before the city council? What is plan B for the administration to be able to deal with that because again, your opportunity to weigh in on this issue is whether the contract is going to be issued or not. So I just want to bring that to council's attention. And, and the reason I brought this to the speaker's attention was for the protection of the process and the protection of the speaker, not knowing necessarily um, that, uh, that and, and frankly, I, I wasn't aware of this memo. And for whatever reason, I didn't have it in my mailbox to my availability. I apologize for that. But I wanted to protect the speaker before the, the speaker sp spoke because I didn't want to have an unintended consequence. Councilman Vieira, and then I would like to go to uh, Ms. Selman. Um, what I was going to say, nothing to the substance, but more of a point of order that maybe um, that we have, like we're, we're kind of dealing with a workshop issue. Now, I understand the, the issue, but maybe we could get to the commendation, continue this for a couple minutes because we have a lot of police officers here and I don't want to you know, just my, my opinion for what it's worth. Thank you. If, if that's council's pleasure, but I, I would say this council that if the gentleman does wish to speak, then it does have consequences for him personally. I just wanted to bring that to his attention. Maybe council could hold the conversation and maybe the gentleman can speak afterwards if he chooses to do so. And we can move forward from there. Is that, is that acceptable to you, sir? So I would say that uh, I will withdraw. I think it's kind of crazy that I cannot address my elected officials on a matter that's before them because it has consequences. But I will withdraw. I understand uh, how, it, uh, how it should go for you to make it easy. And the reason that council is in this position is because of the issuance of the RFP, the fact it's, it was broadcast. Chairman, Councilman Goods. We talked about these RFPs a week ago. This is the point I'm trying to make, I was trying to make. Does council have the authority today to make the administration withdraw this RFP that the community can weigh in on the situation as council asked previously? Well, if council 
wants to formulate a, a motion or a resolution, I can work with council to do that today. You could leave this on the agenda if you but, like. And, and there's a lot of, you're getting into a lot of legal issues. I don't think withdrawal of the RFP is something that's within council's purview. I do think council, when the contract comes before you, if you all want to reject that contract, you can. That is within your purview. I do, there are some salient facts about why I think the administration moved forward the way it did. I think Ms. Newcomb wanted to give you a few of those facts just so you were aware. So. Yes, I can't address the RFP uh, process, but Megan Newcomb, um, Assistant City Attorney representing the Police Department, but I just wanted, if some of you council members are not aware, um, this is um, because the facility on Howard has been delayed, so this is potentially a temporary issue. Um, the Police Department was, uh, was made aware of this, and you know, with construction delays and things, time is changing and deadlines are changing. So unfortunately, we're dependent on um, an outside company to tell us when we can and cannot move our impound lot. So this is essentially a stopgap process. Okay, so that's why it was a, the original RF, uh, RFP was brought to council, and then that was withdrawn uh, once we realized that there were some questions and concerns. After that point, um, myself, Mr. Schmidt, uh, Mr. Spearman, the director of purchasing, as well as other members, had a large meeting with everybody who's on the tow truck uh, list, whether it's rotation towing or police towing. Um, everyone was invited and we sat down for about two hours and discussed everything and hashed everything out and essentially had an open discussion about the position that the police department is in with our impound lot and having to move at a certain time and not having the new place be ready. Um, we addressed those concerns and then because of the timing issue of when we're gonna have to move, that's why this new uh, RFP was sent out. It closes on May 1st, so this silence uh, for potential bidders has to be enforced until May 1st. During this time period, there are uh, certain people, which is Mr. Spearman and Mr. Schmid, that are allowed to address potential bidders and, have, and answer their questions, but no one else in the city is permitted by the rules to address that. So that's the concern, and I apologize that the timing is very wonky, but that's just the situation that we're in. So I just wanted to make sure that you all are aware of some of the background reasoning for why uh, this seems so disjointed. But we uh, changed the RFP after the concerns, and essentially what it does is if you have um, impound towing, which is non-criminal, non-evidentiary, and then police uh, impounds, which are crime-related cases, things like that, um, the initial one address both of them. This, this RFP that's out now only addresses the police towing, so the, the current list of tow truck companies that do rotation would not be altered or affected in any way, regardless of what happens with the secondary issue. And the reason that that was done was because what the police department's issue that we have to resolve is we have vehicles and in the end of July we're not going to have a location to store them while the Howard facility is still under construction. So that's the problem that we're trying to solve. The initial one was withdrawn because it, it encompassed all of the towing. So we've taken that out and we thought that was really the biggest concern uh, that was raised by the tow companies. Um, so that's where we are in the process. Um, we can discuss it after May 1st, but just the way that the timing works, um, that's the reason why uh, this is outstanding. And um, I just wanted to make sure that factually, um, whoever's listening as well as you all um, have that information. Councilwoman Hurtag. I appreciate that description, but you talked about having a lot of people in the room and then having this motion didn't come and talk to us individually about it. And that's the concern. We wanted to talk about whether to do this period. And now we don't, now we're just finding out about this this week, that this was done before we had the discussion that we asked for. Well, Council, I know that Mr. Schmidt spoke with Councilman Goods, and I believe, I don't know if he spoke with you personally, no. but I do believe he did attempt to reach all of you to speak about this prior to filing a memo. Chairman, so if you didn't have that opportunity, I do apologize. I, I, the Chairman, I didn't know. Uh, Councilman Goods. I didn't know what was going to be said. He did call me a couple of days prior today, and I had my concerns with him. And I told him the same thing I just said that we got bamboozled on an impound lot. And he said, well, we, I, Council, I, that was before my time. I'm just trying to fix all this. I said, well, I'm just saying, Council asked for specific things. And I, that was the conversation I had with him. And he said, well, we tried to work things out with the tow truck drivers. And I said, well, we'll see Thursday how they feel about it when they come to talk to us. So again, they don't have the opportunity to talk to us now because an RFP had been put out 
until May 1st. So now we, we're still back to square one to me because the, the emotion was clear by this council what we wanted done. And administration did what they wanted to do versus doing what we asked them to do. And we asked that everything come back to us for a discussion at a workshop. But administration did what they wanted to do. That's why we're in this dilemma today. And it's unfair to the tow truck drivers who are here who want to speak. Everybody might not be in agreement to what some of the other tow truck drivers agree. And that's for us, this council, to decide how we want to proceed with our tow company uh, rotations list. So I'm sorry, but I think another violation has occurred with this council. Uh, the administration overstepped their bounds. Their motion was made, and it was not adhered to. Thank you, Chairman. Councilman Cross. Yeah, I, just looking at this systemically, I would ask that everyone in the administration try to get along with city council going forward. The election's over. All the fighting should be over. We should need to figure out how to get along. Um, um, you know, I, I called the mayor after my election and congratulate her, and we're going to be meeting next week. I hope that she'll be meeting with everybody. Um, we know Ms. Zellman and her staff have been trying to work more closely with us the last few months, and several other people have. Uh, but there are frayed nerves. Um, uh, you know, some of the mayor's staff have intentionally sabotaged and politically attacked us over the last four years. Some of them are going to be up for renewal, and so we'll see how their um, renewal appointments go in the next 30, 60 days. Um, <clears throat> some people do things accidentally, not realizing that they hit a tripwire because the nerves are so frayed. Um, keep in mind that we've all just been through campaigns. Uh, um, Ms. Hertek, the 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 biggest one that was a recipient of 15 or 20 negative uh, mailers probably cost three or four hundred thousand dollars. If you add it all up, probably the negative mailers against the three of us anyway um, uh, were probably two million dollars or a million and a half dollars. And we know we know the packs that they came from, and we're going to see more about where they came from in the past. Um, <clears throat> but uh, just so you all know the kind of person I am, I met with the guy who ran against me. I met with him last week, and I said, let's start over. Let's hit reset. And, you know, he spent 350000 of his own money against me. Um, I'm going to do the same thing with the mayor next week. I would ask that everybody around the mayor stop looking at this as a political issue. Stop, stop looking at, at how we can fight each other, and let's all get along. We have to... We have four years now. This mayor's legacy is going to be defined by the next four years more than any of us, and we all need to work together. Let's please in improve the communication, collaborate. We've, we've six times in the last couple of months, we've approved um, ordinances or resolutions that Ms. Zellman and Morris and her team have helped us put together that, that show that, that we all intend to work together. So let's please um, set aside the the, whatever happened in the last four years, I think, I think all of us would like to get past it. We'd like not to have negative mailers or other things coming our way anymore. Um, attacks like the ones against um, uh, Council Member Goods and Dingfelder, where staff participated. We need to get past all of that, and we need to work together going forward. So please, everybody uh, in the mayor's office, please set up a dialogue, work with us, and, uh, and let's try to move the city forward. Thank you. If I may, Councilman Carlson, you know, uh, there were some vicious things that were mailed out. Nasty, horrible things. And especially last week, someone mailed something out about Councilman Miranda. It was total vicious lies. I personally had a mailer sent out against me that was all falsehoods and half-truths. We all were affected this campaign by negative advertisement. And ladies and gentlemen, it affected all of us. This election has been like any other. And I, I have to say, I am very disappointed in a lot of people out there. Ms. Zellman, would you like to finish this conversation off before we go to the, the, uh, the uh, accommodation? So just a couple of comments. Um, and to everything that Councilman Carlson said, as I've said before, we're all, all of you, all of the administration, everyone in my office, everyone on the staff are here to do what's best for the city of Tampa. Um, but it goes both ways. I agree with you. We all, we have to be respectful of council. You all were elected. I wasn't. I, I respect that. Um, I will defer to you for that reason, but I ask 
the same in return. When I hear comments like, you know, you saw what this motion was and I'm not going to approve this RFP because you didn't comply with the letter of the motion without hearing what Megan was trying to explain, which is TPD was under the gun. TPD had a timing issue. They couldn't wait until after today to issue this RFP. They had to find a place to put these cards. So I, I just ask that you give us the opportunity to explain. Mike Schmidt, I know, tried to reach each of you. If he failed, I apologize for that. He, he was supposed to talk to each of you in advance to explain the timing behind this and why the RFP couldn't wait. Yes, we knew the motion said that, but TPD couldn't wait. Um, as far as the details of the impound lot and what was done, I can't speak to that. But I can tell you that in terms of getting the RFP out, it couldn't wait. And I just ask you to please give him the opportunity to explain that to you before jumping to conclusions that there's some kind of nefarious intent or disrespect being shown to you by the administration, or in this case by TPD, because that just isn't true. So I, I, just, ask, it's, it's, I just ask that we both we all treat each other with respect and give each other the benefit of the doubt and take the opportunity to ask the questions um, and explain these things to each other rather than jumping to conclusions as I saw a little bit here today, which, which was unnecessary. Ms. So Jim? again, um, yes, I'm sorry. Ms. Jim? Are you, are you finished, Ms. Zellman? Yeah, the only thing I want to say, since this may be my only time at the microphone today, is I want to say thank you to both you and Mr. Goods. I have enjoyed working with you uh, from when we served together on the Charter Review Commission until today. Um, thank you for showing us respect and working with us. And I wish both of you the best going forward. I know this won't be the last time we see you. Um, I hope we can all continue to work together in a positive way for the community. So thank you. Thank you, Councilman Goods. Miss, I, I, I have no problem if there was a time crunch, Ms. Zellman. But that's not the issue here. If Mr. Smith knew or Chief Burkhardt knew, that should have been addressed when you met with the tow truck drivers. You had your discussions before you redeed your RP. That could have been a call made to council or, 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 or a special <coughs> amendment on one of the agendas to talk about why we have to move forward. But to get a call, everyone didn't get it in the ninth hour by Mr. Smith, that's something totally different versus you knew beforehand, before today, and in the ninth hour versus if that was the case with the chief and the situation with the drivers, we should have been known of in the loop then, not now. That's all I'm saying. And that's what I'm talking about, that, that this could have been prevented today because had we been in the loop then, we wouldn't be talking. We could say, well, we know why they did what they did. That's my point of what I'm saying. We knew, but we didn't take the appropriate action at the appropriate time. Councilman Miranda. To my good friend from Romania, this is democracy. <laughs> Welcome to America. Thank you so much. I had to break the nose a little bit. But anyway, what, what happened here is not a, a mistake, it's an error. When I played ball a little bit just in the Little League and stuff like that, if you made an error, it was acceptable. You make a mistake, you get bent for 30 days because you were stupid. And that's how the game is played there. And what here we have is an, someone who dropped the ball, like in baseball, that tried maybe communicate with seven council members, and maybe he or she could make it. But there's always aid they could call, that the what if that I've been talking about for a long time comes into play in most instances. If you had not made a contact with a council member, what if they have an aid? What if you leave a message on the phone? What is if you send them a text? What is if you go to the computer and send them an email, whatever? None of those that I know of were done. I'm not sure that it was done or not. But what we're saying is, we're not against what's happening. We're against the process, how it is happening, and not really against it. Estamos tratando de arreglar todo esto. Since you're Romanian, maybe you're close to Spain, you understand what I said. We're trying to fix this in front of the general public, and that's what democracy is all about. You see, one lesson that we're learning today 
is that the seven of us cannot talk to each other about anything that's on this agenda. So therefore you say, that way the seven of us can't get in trouble. We're trying to avoid a system. And you can communicate with the mayor, and the mayor can communicate with you individually, but not together. And they be what? One at a time. So this is a lesson that we're all learning on that side and on this side. And that's called democracy. So we welcome you here, welcome what you're listening to. And what we're trying to figure out is how we can get facilitate the police department to take their cars to have evidencia, evidence, into a lot that's secured. Because that's like CSI on TV, CSI in New York, CSI in Miami. They find a speck of dust and they can tell you where you came from in the car. And they always catch the fellows. I don't know how to do that, but they always catch them. So what I'm saying is that these are the things that we're trying to work out so that no one gets hurt, not the police department, so they can take their cards, which I guess is 15% or 20% of something. I'm just taking a guess, throwing it out, see how close I'm coming, to move those cars. And then the others that are picked up due to an automobile accident or stuff like that, they go to another lot. I believe that's the issue that we have in front of us now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to go to Councilman Vera and then Councilman Carlson. I just, again, what I said 20 minutes ago, we're an hour. I, 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 the, we have about 20 cops who are waiting for a commendation. I, this is not to comment whatsoever on the substance of the important issues we're talking about, which are entitled to a vigorous discussion. Can, can we just do the commendation? Because we have like 20 police officers who are, you know, not on the streets right now. I mean, we're, it's, it's 10 o'clock. And again, this is not to comment substantively on the discussion. I respect everyone's opinions. It's a lot of very important issues that are happening here. Um, but I just, just I, I make a motion uh, to, to have this heard right now, please, if I may. Second. We have a motion made by Councilman uh, Vieira, seconded by Councilman Maniscalco. All in favor say aye. Aye. Is there any opposed? Councilman Carlson, quickly. Yeah. <clears throat> Where's Ms. Selman? Ms. Selman, it just for everybody, everybody watching on staff, pl please everybody understand that nerves are frayed right now. Um, uh, you know, you, when you get a barrage of negative stuff coming at you, you're, you, you know, my kids cried a couple nights looking at that stuff, and it, it affects you in lots of ways. So everybody, please um, understand that nerves are frayed, and let's all try to communicate and over communicate to prevent this from happening in the future. The last thing I'll say is that. Um, I contacted uh, Ms. Nicole Travis, head of uh, economic opportunity for the city, and she uh, rearranged her schedule. She's meeting with the Romanians now. So um, they have just left the room, and we thank them for coming. We will come back to public comments. Let's go now to ceremonials. Councilman Goods. Morning again, gentlemen. I have the distinct pleasure of. Uh, he needs no introduction. He protects us every, every Thursday, every every meeting. To make sure we're safe in this chamber. He's done a great job my four years, and again, I didn't know him a lot when I was a police officer because he's behind me a little bit. But what I can say is that he stays true. He stays loyal. And he's worked hard for us, uh, especially this this four years, because it's you know it's been some times in the council chambers. So I want to personally say congratulations to you when I found that you were retiring next week Tuesday. So I want to make sure it was not robbery that I make sure you get your accolades for the work you've done for this community and for these council members in this chamber. Thank you. So I'll let the chief come up. He wants to say a few words, and then I'll read the. Accommodation for Mari. Good morning, Council. It's it's an honor that you all are recognizing one of our finest, and Armani was definitely one of our finest. It's sad to see him go. I do have his commanding officer here, Captain Blazioli, so I'd like to him to speak a little bit on some specifics. Yeah. So um, I've had the opportunity to work with Amari for almost four years now, um, and I've had the opportunity to supervise officers in all different capacities. Um, and one thing I will say about Amari, I talk with him every morning. Um, very, um, very professional in everything, whether it's casual conversations or what he's doing. He's represented us. He's represented this bureau. Um, he's kind of the set it and forget it. Um, he only called me when he needed to. He takes care of business. Um, and when he moves on to his next endeavor, we're going to, you know, probably hear about him, what he's doing. So a lot of skills. Um, 
opportunity to uh, introduce uh, Officer Barbosa. I think he's going to move right in. Um, we had a selection process for that as well, and um, I think it's going to be a seamless transition. So. All right, my friend. In recognition of Amari Elmore for a year for your dedication, devotion, and service to the Tampa Police Department and the Tampa City Council office for 23 years, Amari began his career with the City of Tampa Police Department in May 2000 and has since progressed from a police officer to a mass patrol officer, a part of the department's SWAT team for 17 years. I did not know you were part of the SWAT team, man. Wow. Since April 2019, Amari has served the Tampa City Council Chambers in his duties as an MPO. Uh, Mr. Uh, Elmore, you have earned the respect of your superiors, peers, and the great citizens of, of the amazing city. Congratulations to you on your retirement. You've exceeded the mark and went above and beyond the call of duty for a job well done. It is our sincere gratitude to present to you this accommodation today, the 27th. Appreciate you, my brother. Thank you very much. Appreciate you. My wife, <laughs> Jessica. You better. You're getting in trouble, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Councilman Goods and um, the council for the uh, for the commendation. Um, it's been entertaining and educational over the last four and a half years, to say the least. Uh, I enjoyed it. Uh, it was definitely a part of my job that uh, I never knew what was going to happen, especially when we were over at TCC during uh, the COVID um, time. So I wanted to say thank you for the commendation on that. I also want to thank... Um, Marty Shelby, uh, the council aides, the city clerks, and the CCTV guys for all the assistance that they gave me and um, made the job, like I said, just kind of entertaining and, and it was a pleasure to come uh, do that part of it. Um, I'd like to thank my squad um, for showing up. Uh, they kind of bailed me out when I couldn't be here. Um, I know it wasn't you know, <laughs> the, the best part of their day, but I, I appreciate them covering for me. And um, that's about it. All right, thank you. Councilman Miranda. Myra, you said a few words that I got to see but if I can. Uh, you've been in the streets before, and you worked on a squad before. Where did you get more flack, out on the street or in this hall? Street. <laughs> street. Hear you. The street. I, I want to make sure that the public knows. Where was it at? <laughs> the street. Okay. I want to, I want to make sure. Gotcha. But it's been a process. I, I know you when you first came here four years ago, and the mannerism that you used to, we'd stand by the door for a while, I thought I was looking at somebody who was stuffed because you wouldn't move. And I said, relax, you can sit down once in a while when you get tired. But you want to do your job perfectly. And I admire you for all that. I admire you for your mannerism, the way you look around, and, and you don't sit back and relax. You always tend to, one word means a lot to you more than it means to us because those, those are key words that you learn. What comes next? And I appreciate all the work that you've done and congratulations to you and to your family. And, I hope that you retirement, it's for a long time, but I'm sure it's not, because I guarantee you within 60 days you're going to be working somewhere else. <laughs> and I don't blame you for that. The longer you work, remember this from a guy that's 82 years old, the longer you work, the longer you live. The shorter you work, the sooner you don't live. So remember that. Thank you very know. much. God bless you. Thank you. Councilwoman Hurtag. Um, thank you so much for everything you've done. Not only have you been here, but I've noticed the little things you do, um, helping people get out or get in, just little things that most people might not have done. And I just want to thank you for that because those little gestures always mean so much to the, the person and it really shows who you are. And I just really want to say thank you and I wish you all the best in retirement with whatever you do, work or not, um, and congratulations to your whole family. Thank you. Councilman Mascarca. You know, we hate to see you go because you're so young. And when I heard <laughs> retirement, uh, you know, it's just, it's amazing. But thank you for always being uh, so professional, always professional. It was mentioned earlier, and it's true. Uh, from here to the convention center when we had, you know, COVID and social distancing, very complicated times. But you were there, again, always professional, always helpful, always standing guard, always keeping an eye out. And uh, we've really enjoyed working with you. And uh, thank you for always taking care of us. And we wish you all the best in your retirement and whatever the future holds for you. Thank you. Councilman Vieira. Thank you very much. And, and you know, I, I, I thank you, Councilman Goods, for putting this forward. And, and, uh, and Amari, I, uh, you know, you're, you're a good guy. You're very thoughtful. And it's so nice to see your wonderful wife. And you've 
you talked about her before and what a wonderful woman she is. And you know, you're you're a friend and you're we, we've had a lot of good conversations over the years, a lot of conversations, including on a lot of uh, you know, civic and social things and our different thoughts on it, and you're a very thoughtful person. You really, really are. Um, you've got wonderful temperament. Um, you're very calm, and, uh, and, and as been said before, you've been with us through some really tough times. You mentioned the convention center. I mean, I remember a lot of times when we had, um, during the uh, 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 post-George Floyd months, um, uh, gosh, 50, 100 people, maybe, not, maybe even more there, and stuff could have happened. And, and you were over there, and you were always going to be our front line of defense there. Um, just for anything, because you all know all it takes is one person, right, in any kind of incident right now, any, any time. Um, and, and you were always there, and you were always a wonderful front line of defense, and you're, um, again, you've got great temperament, you're always very calm, uh, and you're a good person. So I'm, I'm glad to see you get this, and, and I know we're going to keep in touch because you're a good dude. Thank, thank you. you. Councilman Cross. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for the public who may not know who he is. Um, sorry if this is over exaggeration, but he's kind of like the secret service person for city council. <laughs> Um, and where the mayor has one person just for her, we have one for seven, and so um, uh, plus all of our, our aides and staff. So, um, I mean, you really were the person standing in the line of fire if something happened, and appreciate it. And to Jessica, thank you for supporting him and allowing him to do that. And and he was not just here <clears throat> uh, protecting us here, but uh, nights and weekends we had his cell phone number, and there was an incident where. I was at an event and protesters threatened my kids and I had to call him and he responded right away and was helpful in dealing with that. And so um, we, there are a lot of things that you do that we don't see. It's not that you're just sitting, you know, by, standing by the wall, you're actually out there protecting us. And, and it, it's an important thing because it's a crazy world out there right now. Um, there, are, there are many, many <clears throat> very good experienced police officers that are gonna be leaving in the next few years. And uh, we're not gonna be able to thank all of them individually like this, but um, you're a great example of, um, of the hardworking men and women that we have out there. And we need to make sure that you all are our best ambassadors to make sure we get good people like you to replace you <laughs> because we need really good officers. So thank you and enjoy. Um, please stay in touch and let us know what you do next. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody that walks through this door is welcome. Welcome to see how our government works and to watch us do our jobs. But every now and then, there are a couple of people that you're a little concerned about, like the gentleman who was eating his clipboard the other night. <laughs> and you and I developed this language where we could look at one another. And he would, he would look at me and say, we cool? Are we all right? Is this thing OK? And it could even be, hey, what are we having for dinner tomorrow night? <laughs> Thank you for all you have done. Thank you for uh, developing a different language with me. and. Uh, I know that you're not leaving anywhere. I'm not, I know you're not going too far. Thank you for everything you've done for the last four years. Thank you very much. Chambers that wishes to speak to public comment. Anyone else that wishes to speak to public comment? If not, yes. Mr. Randolph, are you? ceremony um, something. 
I want to say good morning, and I'm Shagret Doss. I was uh, here last week. And shortly after I finished making some comments last week, I observed the city's attorney uh, making comments about me when I was leaving the, the building. And although I appreciate her speaking so kindly about my uh, prowess as a pro se or self-represented litigant, I thought it was necessary for me to give some um, context to her comments. <clears throat> and I want to do this without appearing to attempt to litigate or relitigate, uh, re to litigate the case that I have ongoing in the federal court or relitigate the case that I already won, which uh, brings me here. And like, you know, I'm a, I didn't say it last time, but I'm a veteran of the United States military, the United States Army, in fact. And like the people up here, I took an oath to uphold certain constitutional pr uh, principles. So, and as a citizen of Florida, I'm beholden to certain provisions in our constitution, actually all of them really, and certain legislative dictates as well, which is no different than any other public official. Now, and we can go to 876 subsection 5 of the Florida statute, which I'm sure all you all are familiar with because you had to sign it when you took office and everybody who gets, who gets employed signs one as well. But Article 1, Section 24 of the Florida Constitution gives me a right to access this meeting and to speak to you all as my uh, representatives. And even if I weren't litigating against the city of Tampa, I have a right to come in here and talk to you all about any issue I have with my government, and which is what brought me here. Now, so for everybody's edification, I paid the TPD money to get some records, which is why I had to do the public records request because for some reason they sent me on a wild goose chase and I went to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement and the Sheriff and I got what I needed for the most part to my knowledge from both of those uh, agencies. The agency that didn't give me anything is the agency that sent me a bill for $10,000. Now what I'm asking the council to do is to instruct somebody somewhere to give me an itemized list of what would take 461 and a half hours which is 12 weeks of working time to give me, and we could probably come to some sort of mutual um, and amicable uh, resolution as to what it is exactly that I'm looking for and they can give it to me. So with that being said, um, and again, I wanna reiterate in case she runs up here later on, I'm not trying to litigate uh, the federal case, uh, 22 CV 129 or any other ongoing cases. I just want what I asked for, which is my right as a citizen of the state of Florida. You people take care. And I uh, look forward to the next four years. <laughs> All right, y'all take care. Thank you. Mr. Randolph, are you on the line? Yes. My name is Michael Randolph, and I'm with the West Tampa Community uh, Development Corporation. Today I want to talk about just community elementary school being closed. If you remember back in the 1990s, there was a movie called Living in Cup. And the phrase that I'm taking from that is say, homie, don't play me. <laughs> know that we're from West Tampa. In the 90s and early 200s and early 2000s, they tried to close the library. We was dead. We kept it open. They also tried to close the post office. We was dead and we kept it open. Moving on F. C plus, that's our proposal related to just elementary, based on best practices from around the country, especially one that's called Community Building and Partnership, and the other one is called the Harlem School Zone in New York. Both of these initiatives show when the community come together how you can turn a felon grade into a passing grade. And this was done through a public, private, and non-profit uh, relationship. On May the 8th of this year, West Tampa Community uh, CDC plans to give an emergency meeting on just elementary school to present to the school board on May the 9th. For those that are interested, reach us at westtampacdc at gmail.com. Our current initiative includes the Technology Wealth Building Center, community engagement, and public safety, and now the education initiative. Within the next three days, over 100 neighborhood groups throughout Tampa will be receiving an email asking you all y'all to join us in our endeavor to make a difference. 
like Charlie said earlier, this is what democracy look like. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. Our next speaker is Carol Ann Bennett. Do we have her online? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Carol Ann Bennett. I just want to make a brief comment on the recent election. Um, I've lived in Tampa all my life, and I've never seen local elections like what we saw this time. I've never seen anything so dirty and nasty. Um, and apparently Sandy Friedman and former Chief Dugan agree with me because they said so publicly. Um, I can't even tell you how many people called me, emailed me, texted me, DM'd me, PM'd me, social media in the grocery store about how their mailboxes day after day after day were being stuffed with attack mailers and they hated it. And you know what they said to me? Every single one of them, they said, that means I'm not voting for that person because I don't want that trash clogging up my mailbox. And South Tampa responded loud and clear. Really? They soundly defeated anyone who did that type of campaigning. Yeah. So I'm just hoping that everybody takes notice that if you're gonna run for office in districts one through four, you better run a clean campaign or South Tampa's gonna give you the boot. I wanna thank Councilman Citro and Councilman Goods for your years of service. Um, you couldn't, I don't know how much you'd have to pay me to get me to do that job. In fact, I think you'd, the only way you get me to do that job is if you paid off my nieces and my nephew's student loans, and the city doesn't have that kind of money. Um, I'd, I'd rather have hot poker stuck in my eyes than do the job you guys did. So I want to thank you for your years of service. And um, Councilman Goods, I want to I want to say to you specifically, I, I never, I knew nothing about you before you got elected. I've been appearing before city council for over five years now as a neighborhood advocate. And when you got elected, I had no idea what to expect. And I just want to say that one of the things that I noticed about you was that you treated everybody the same, whether they could vote for you or not. You treated every citizen who came before you the same. And I cannot say that of every councilman I've, I've known on this council and the previous city council. And sometimes you could tell just by the way a council person voted, whether they were in their, whether the neighborhood people who were there were in their district or not. But you can't say that about you. You treated everybody the same. Everybody in the city was just as important to you as everybody else. And I want to thank you for that and commend you for that. And I'm going to miss you. And I wish you and Councilman Citro all the luck in the world. And I hope there's nothing but good things in both of yours future. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anyone else on the line? Okay. Uh, with council's uh, permission, uh, items agenda number six and seven have been asked to move to the beginning of our workshop. Yes, that's great. May I have a motion from you, please? So moved. Second. 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 Motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Miranda. The agenda items number six and seven be moved to the beginning of our workshop. All in favor say aye. Aye. Is there any objection? Motion passes. Mr. Benson. Good morning. Stephen Benson, City Planning Director. Mr. Uh, Benson, shall we start with agenda item number six, file number CM23-80244? Yes, sir. Thank you. This is the update on the Tree Trust Fund. I believe both motions uh, dealt with uh, an update to the Tree Trust Fund. Uh, before, uh, I'm joined by uh, uh, Director of Parks and Recreation, Teresa Hills, and we're going to speak to the, both of those items. But before we get into the nuts and bolts of the fund, um, this is a timely motion because the University of South Florida and University of Florida have uh, recently completed the tree canopy analysis that has been uh, long uh, awaited for. And so uh, Dr. Sean Landry and Dr. Andrew Kozer are here today to provide a brief update uh, that we will then go forward and release to the community and uh, have some meetings and discuss and determine uh, next steps and what should be done to address the recent reduction in canopy. So um, before Sharisha and I present, I'd like to ask uh, council to entertain a presentation from Dr. Sean Landry and Dr. Andrew Kozer.
we bring up the presentation, please? We have it here, it's just not up on the... There we go, go. perfect. And then how do I advance? So I just... It's this right here. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for having me today. My name is Andrew Kozer. I'm here with Sean Landry. And the third in our trio, Dr. Rebecca Zarger, is actually going to be voicing over her presentation. She did the values assessment of what the public of Tampa want in the urban forest. And that will be the third part of this presentation, technology willing. So um, you can see here this is the 2021 report. It is 2023. Uh, it's pretty hefty. It took a long time to compile all the data. Um, and it was, it's, it's, a, it's a large effort, and I commend the city for doing it. Um, we have um, a five-year assessment. The city has a five-year assessment of its urban forest. And one of the biggest questions that is asked every five years is how does the canopy of the city change? The canopy, if you're looking at it, um, is the tree cover looking top down. If you, you know, if, uh, how much of that area is covered by tree and how much of it is covered by hardscape such as roads and buildings and other things or just bare ground. Um, we, in this assessment, we look at what the canopy is doing over time, which is something that few other cities do, which is commendable. Um, and we see if that change aligns with the, the goals of the city. And the goals that are expressed by the city um, as it is now is no net change in canopy over time, keeping consistent even as things change and grow. Um, and then in addition to that top-down view, which Sean does, we look at the base level. Uh, my crew goes through off of the ground and looks at the condition of the trees, the species uh, diversity, and how things look up close, which you can't get from a satellite or a plane. Um, and then this year, we had several new um, aspects that we always add a few different things to our assessment. And there was a heat map assessment, where are the hot zones in the city? which is, uh, I know, on the minds of a lot of cities in Florida. Um, we looked at potential tree planting areas, and then also a, um, the social science assessment of what people valued and how, how much they um, value and, and will support efforts to green the city. And then lastly, there was an assessment of environmental e equity. So, you know, does everyone in the city have stay the same access or the access that they want to trees and green spaces and recreational areas? Um, as I, I said before, there's, it's kind of a mix of a top-down and a bottom-up approach, um, kind of um, from you know, aerial views, which is what Sean will show you in a little bit, to the bottom view, which is my crew. We have 201 permanent plots throughout the city. My crew is wading waist deep through water in cypress swamps, dodging alligators, or getting special permission to go to McDill to get this data for you to look at. Um, it's, it's quite an undertaking, but we take our care to make sure that you have the best information available to make your decisions. Um, and so there's several different approaches that we do for the aerial assessment. The most labor intensive, but the most accurate is to put random points throughout the city and see, have a person visually say there's a tree there or not. And that allows us to assess canopy changes over time with different kinds of photographic evidence from better cameras and stuff as they evolve. Um, in addition to that, Sean and his team, um, they do what is a LIDAR in aerial photo. LIDAR is like lasers scanning the surface of the earth. Um, and they can do maps to see exactly where the trees are and what neighborhoods. And that's how we do the assessment, see who has trees and who has not, and how things change over time at a very local scale, neighborhood level or um, district level. Uh, this is all part of an existing um, management plan that the city has enacted in the past. The, um, the city has a 20-year kind of time frame and a five-year cycle where they look at what things are going and if, we're working towards, if you are working towards your long-term goals with the management efforts that they have, and they can use that five-year assessment period to change the course if things are going awry. So at the top, we have the tree canopy urban forest analysis, which is what I'm showing you today and what Sean and Rebecca are showing you. Um, but it's part of a bigger system where we have an internal working group where the city has all of its experts internally in the city working towards common goals to ensure that trees have a place in the city. Um, they are advised externally by folks, experts from outside the city and an external advisory committee. Um, and then 
that th these two groups work together to make sure when they see the data, whether or not the city's on the right course. And then with that um, starts the new cycle of five years where things are continuously monitored to see um, where the future will bring us. And then a little bit of my data, and then I'll pass it on to Sean. So um, you can see here that our city is dominated by um, things that are kind of in the natural remnants of the, of the, ex the past forests, um, mangroves along the coastlines, cypresses along the swamp areas, showing that those untouched areas that are still intact um, are providing a lot of the benefit for the city when it regard to what trees are available. We also have things like Brazilian pepper, which are from Brazil, uh, not exactly a native species, um, but something we deal with um, throughout the city. And then the trees that you are probably familiar with, laurel oaks, live oaks, cabbage palms, even if you don't know their names, they, they show up um, and they're quite prevalent in our managed areas. Um, this is what we call a distribution of the diameter of the trees. Trees grow every year that they live. It, they grow or they die. So we can use their girth, their size of their trunks to estimate their age and get a sense of how long they have left on this earth, right? Um, you can see here that the vast majority of the trees are small, which tells you two things. Um, you have a future, you have a future forest that's coming, but um, you know, the big trees are also the ones that provide a lot of the benefits and they, they cannot be understated. So we have a young population, things are popping up a lot of in the remnant areas as well, as I said, a lot of the swamps have a lot of young new growth. Um, and we want to continue to make sure that those things reach a, a, a bigger size to maximize the benefits. And then I'll leave you with this. Um, speaking of benefits, uh, we run all this thing, all this through a forest service model that was developed by David Nowak, one of um, um, Al Gore's Nobel laureate team. And we look at quantifying the benefits in a way that maybe makes sense when you're looking at the cost of fire trucks and police cars and things like that. What are, can we quantify some of these benefits? Can we relate them into things that the public can understand? Um, one of the things that we um, measured is how much carbon trees sequester. How much do they soak up in their wood over time? And that counteracts the carbon that we burn off in coal and fossil fuels. Um, our, your urban forest in Tampa um, soaks up the same amount of carbon that is used in the entire city for 13 days. Um, it cancels out the emissions from 15,000 cars in a year. And it um, also nulls out, or nulls out, actually, uh, 20,000 homes, like what they would em emit through um, just operating AC and things like that. Um, from a dollars and cents point of view, the trees in this city, and this is a, we, we look at exactly where the trees are in our plots and how they relate to buildings. Um, they save the city 7.5 million in cooling costs um, from air conditioning. Uh, there's $9.5 million in associated reduced health costs from like asthma, uh, from particulate inflammation in the lungs and stuff like that. Um, and and this, is, this is something that they've seen in other studies where like we're de devastating infestations wipe through a city and they actually see the spikes of health cases rise in their local hospitals. Um, and then finally, as you know, we see in Fort Lauderdale last, last week, flooding is a problem in Florida. Um, probably won't be able to you know, help with the rains that they saw last week, but our urban forest does soak up 5 point, 560 million gallons of water um, during storm events, which is about enough to fill that main aquarium of the Tampa Aquarium over a thousand times. So. Great, thanks. I'm Sean Landry from University of South Florida. Um, so there's a lot in this report, which I know you all have a copy of. Um, hopefully we'll be giving presentations to the public and explaining some of it, answering questions. And we're, I'm always available to do that anyway. But um, one of the things we did was we mapped out the tree canopy. Uh, every six inches, we know whether it was canopy, grass, impervious surface, buildings. And one of the things that we can take from that, and obviously there's a lot more in the report, but the majority of canopy in the city of Tampa is on residential properties. So when you're thinking about policies you know, related to canopy, it's residential properties that are the majority of it, um, as well as some public right-of-way, transportation, and some, some public areas. 
Of course, one of the things we've looked at ever since we started doing this was how the canopy has been changing over time. Uh, this year, we went back to older aerial imagery from 1948, 1973, and 1995. I couldn't find any in the 1980s, unfortunately. Um, but what we found is, you know, the canopy increased since Tampa started developing. Um, and then over the last five years, it, it increased a bit in 2011, but then it's gone down. And so, unfortunately, in 2021, we have the lowest level of canopy that we've had since we started monitoring in detail in 2006. Um, the equivalent loss in terms of area of canopy since 2011 is, is essentially four times the area of Davis Islands. Um, and so just to put that in perspective, um, we're currently at 30% tree canopy citywide, which is sort of a, a weird metric in the scientific community that we kind of base that 30% as a, as a good target threshold mm -hmm. for sort of various well-being and, and various health effects. And so um, we want to be careful not to drop below that. So I just wanted to give you a visual of sort of 1948 to now. And so when you think about the city of Tampa, what was here before us was essentially really sparsely treed uh, pine flatwoods, if you're familiar with that kind of habitat. And so as people move in, people are landscaping, and it's really the landscaped forest that le leads to the canopy we have today. And so that kind of reflects people's desire for trees, which is also reflected in the survey results. But it's pretty interesting when you look back at different areas of the city and those older imagery, and you see there was really nothing there before in terms of trees, and now there's a large canopy. So when you break it down uh, by planning district, which is sort of the way the urban forest management plan uh, sets the tone for evaluating no net loss of, of canopy, um, in planning districts in South Tampa, in Central Tampa, there was a decrease um, in canopy. 6% down in South Tampa, 3.3% um, down in Central Tampa. And both of those are sort of statistically significant, meaning you know, our measurements have error. Obviously, all measurements have error. But if you even consider that error, it's a uh, statistically significant decline. The other areas, there was a slight decrease. But those you know, sort of were not significant, if you want to put it in those terms. We can't say with absolute certainty whether that decrease was real in those areas. But we can do that in central Tampa and south Tampa. Um, of course, because we present to you, we always like to break it down by city council district. Once again, of course, South Tampa is down. Um, uh, there's also you know, decreases at large. And then in um, uh, district, uh, which district is it over in West Shore? Uh, six? No. Um, anyway, there's some decreases on, that you can see on the map. There's more in the report, but I won't dwell on that. Another thing we do is we, we mapped out urban heat this time. So you can kind of, a proxy for urban heat is the land surface temperature, which we can measure from satellite imagery. Um, and so it, it reflects the kind of differences in temperatures people are going to be feeling in different parts of the city <laughs> on the same day, given the same circumstances. You've heard of the urban heat island effect. It's sort of in that, in that vein. But there's obviously a strong relationship between canopy, areas that have canopy, have much lower temperatures. So when we look at the uh, relationship between canopy and urban heat, you know, we see that those areas with a lot of canopy have lower heat, um, or, and um, consequently areas with more or less canopy have higher heat. So it's one of those things you can use to sort of strategically target maybe tree planting efforts and other things like that. We did a sort of an equity analysis, if you will. We just wanted to see how the social demographics of people in the city in different parts of the city relate to some of these factors. So canopy and urban heat. Uh, one of the stronger relationships we found is that, um, unfortunately, urban heat is higher in lower income neighborhoods in the city of Tampa. They're also, it's also higher in areas with a greater proportion of Hispanic residents people who self-report as being Hispanic background. Um, so those, those are the two relationships. Uh, there weren't many other strong relationships 
uh, in that equity analysis. So hopefully now when I press this button, uh, Dr. Zarger will give a voiceover on her slides and then keep it on track. So otherwise I'll muddle through it. Hello, I'm Rebecca Zarger of the Department of Anthropology at USF, and I'm going to share the social science results on the public's values and opinions about trees. What do trees mean for the people living, working, and playing in our city? What benefits and challenges do they see for the future of the urban forest? We asked residents, business owners, developers, and others to share their values and opinions with us. We also asked questions about the city's maintenance of trees, information received, and what people know about regulations affecting tree removal and pruning. We heard the priorities residents have and looked at how that varies by factors such as age, gender, ethnicity and race, income, and location in the city. Focus groups with city staff who work with trees informed the survey questions and over a thousand people responded to the online and in-person survey. More of that information can be found in the full report, and we welcome the chance to chat more about the full social science study. So please contact me if you're interested. Today I highlight a few key findings. So who took the survey? We had participation from every part of the city, representing dozens of neighborhood associations. The map you see here shows the number of residents by zip code, with darker shaded areas having the most participants in the survey. Over 300 people who completed the survey also volunteered to talk with us one-on-one -on -one about trees. That's an incredibly high number and shows the level of interest in the topic. As the study progressed, interviews were completed and targeted zip codes with fewer survey participants. These are the lighter green areas to ensure views from all areas of Tampa are represented and equity and variability were captured by our methods. Overall, we did 35 interviews to supplement the survey. For those who completed the survey, the largest group were people who were between 35 to 44 years old, tended to be single family homeowners versus 10% who were renters, was roughly even across income levels, 50% white, 12% other racial ethnic categories, and 36% declining to answer that question. We had a diverse group of participants in the interviews and the public meetings, but more work needs to be done to connect with black and Hispanic residents on this issue. We wanted to understand values and benefits of trees as well as drawbacks. One thing is clear from our study. People have strong opinions about trees. Trees are very connected to a sense of place in Tampa, and as one resident told us, these trees hold a very intense and very rich natural history. Many reflected on the cross-generational aspects of trees and how they relate to overall well-being. The number one benefit people listed in the survey was shade. This word cloud shows which benefits were mentioned most often in the survey responses, as well as the other top benefits, including improving air quality and providing space for birds and wildlife. This matches up fairly well with the scientists' measures of ecosystem services from trees mentioned earlier. There were many more varied responses on the drawbacks of trees, but the word damage was the most often mentioned word. People shared drawbacks about the cost of pruning, removal, and permits, and the risk of damage to property from falling limbs and trees due to storms, diseased and dying trees, or lack of maintenance. People also mentioned roots impacting sidewalks, roads and pipes, allergies, and trees causing conflict between neighbors. One of the key issues and takeaways from the study is that the lack of affordable access to tree maintenance was raised in many neighborhoods across the city. Most felt it was either somewhat or very expensive. There's a great interest in expanding existing programs that reduce this burden. Greater attention to maintenance of trees could be a way to lower risk from tree damage like falling limbs, ultimately preventing tree canopy loss and addressing greater urban heat in lower income areas, which we heard about earlier. Finally, there's interest and support for expanding tree planting in desired areas. Many residents who participated expressed concern about the recent pace of tree canopy loss and the impacts of regulations surrounding tree removal. There's a concern that current rates of tree replacement are not proportionate to trees being removed. Okay, and that was her presentation, so I'm glad she was able to give it and not me. Um, 
Uh, let's, if we can go back to the slides. Yeah, you're up. Um, so one of the things we did by mapping out the, the canopy as well as grass and shrub and impervious areas is we can sort of look at the areas where we, what we can call potential tree planting areas. So we define that as basically areas where there's not impervious surface, you know. You don't have to rip anything up to plant, you know, and we also defined it by it had to be a certain size, you know, a size that was sufficient to plant a tree. And when we look at that, we can just sort of map out where you can plant trees. And the, the take home from this is that there's a lot of room to plant trees in the city of Tampa. Um, and so then one of the things that we can do um, is, you know, when, when the, the city can use this information, you know, as they're prioritizing where to plant, potentially they're looking at possible areas. Of, of course, you have to look at the on-site conditions, you know, look at, make sure there's no conflicts with other infrastructure, things like that. Um, but the other thing we found in, in, the, in the survey also is that, you know, basically there's, most people want more trees. So you've got a lot of planting spaces, people want trees. That's not going to be an issue. You just have to plant them. <laughs> Um, and, and the other thing we can do with this is start to identify prior to particular areas where you might plant trees. And one of the things is the right-of-way. And so this is just a map showing these red areas are, are areas of right-of-way where there's tree planting potential. Um, and so you can imagine you overlay this with other information about certain neighborhoods or priority areas. And you really sort of refine the potential for where you want to plant before you have to spend money sending people out in the field to actually inspect every you know, right of way in the city. Kind of use, the, use our data to sort of help prioritize things. Um, so that was, that was really it. The next steps of this are we plan to have a public meeting. I'm not sure when. So the scheduling's in the works. Um, hopefully we'll be developing some more sort of materials to help get the results of the study out in a form that might not be so thick. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, you know, this is, we're, we're very happy that this will inform sort of upcoming discussions about urban forest management plan and that whole effort so that you take this, the science, and turn it into policy that sort of moves everybody in the direction you want to go. Um, and so with that, I guess I will, uh, we can take any questions. Um, Councilman Maniscalco. Thank you very much. And first, let me compliment you on an amazing presentation. Uh, Mr. Benson, who I, I believe has more to present, uh, we went over and uh, Witt, who's in the audience, we had a, a very long discussion a few weeks ago about this. Uh, and it's fascinating because it's, it's something that a lot of people don't think about, trees. You know? But look at the importance of trees. Um, and look at the benefits of trees. And you brought up a couple of interesting uh, numbers and, and in this data the tree canopy uh, reduction I was looking at you, you put more years but looking at just from 2011 to 20 you know for the last decade we've gone from 34 percent to 30 percent doesn't seem like a lot however I have um, this image here um, of how many homes have been raised in South Tampa raised R-A-Z-E-D you know we've seen a lot of new construction how many trees have we lost because of that you broke it up into districts, District 4, the South Tampa area, and then District 6, with the loss that they've experienced over the last several years in trees. Um, you had mentioned that a 10% increase in the canopy would reduce, or could reduce, heat-related deaths 3 to 32%. That's very significant. Um, we see the uh, impact of, of the heat and how it um, is worse uh, in the lower income areas of this community. However, we talked about the cost of maintenance of trees, the damage that trees will do with their roots, sidewalks, and whatnot, whatever. However, we do have programs, and we have like the East Tampa Tree Trimming Program, but is it, is it significant enough? Should we expand that because it's very expensive to prune and maintain and keep those trees that we have to, that are necessary to the health of our environment and the health of the people in this community, again, you know, we are, um, we are recognized as one of the best tree canopies in the world here in the city of Tampa. How do we protect that? We have a lot of development. We have a lot of other issues that you've mentioned. Um, we can't continue seeing these declining numbers, although small percentages, the, the, the impact is tremendous. Um, a couple of questions that I have, you know, regarding annual reports, 
um, uh, with the tree fund? Are we getting those annual reports on the annual basis? I don't think we are. Uh, we have Natural Resources Advisory Committee that's supposed to meet twice a year. What is the state and what is the status of that committee? And are they meeting that twice a year? Because again, in the last several years, we're seeing reduction. You know, we're seeing a reduction in the tree canopy. We're seeing a reduction in seagrass levels in our water. As a greater, you know, overlooking everything, our environment, we can't, we have to be very careful. You know, if we plateau, that's fine because we're not decreasing our, our tree canopy. We're not adversely affecting our, uh, our environment. But are we putting safeguards in place? Are we keeping a watchful eye? We're, we're not going to continue this decline. You know, those are my questions, and I know I'm looking at Mr. Benson, but again, you gave, uh, you know, wonderful data, and it's a really, really in-depth presentation, and it's eye-opening because, you know, again, the importance of the tree canopy and protecting that. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, we, I'm happy to speak. I think those were the questions were sent in. Is that, that correct? Those were some of the questions that we received. So we, we, can, we can definitely answer those. Um, I think some of them are going to be answered in our presentation. So if we can go through the slides and then I can wrap okay, up and fill in the gaps at the end if, that, if that's okay. Okay. Thank you, you very much. Do you have a question? That's, uh, but yes. Were there more <laughs> questions for, for USF yeah. and UF? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I want to say thank you for this. This is an amazing presentation, and I finally get to say go Gators to my UF person, so <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Everybody gets the bowls. Rarely do I get a Gator moment. So, um, uh, But I, I want to say thank you for the in-depthness of this. Uh, one of the things that I was happy to see on this presentation was the <coughs> decline in camphers, which I know is a huge problem tree, um, and the fact that it wasn't on the top 10 was I thought was a good thing. Uh, I want to echo um, Councilman Maniscalco's desire to maybe expand the tree trimming program, which you mentioned in there, and the fact that uh, uh, something that's concerning that I think the city really needs to pay attention to is the size of the trees that we are currently, that, that make up the canopy. Um, that that uh, bar graph is, is very, very, um, eye-opening, it's, it's sobering how young our trees are and the concern that I see and that a lot of residents are talking to me about are the fact that a lot of these younger trees are mitigation trees and that our pub the public does not understand that they are not allowed to cut mitigation trees down. Mm -hmm. Once they move into a house, they don't know that this tree is supposed to stay there and that they can't take it out. So I know we'll talk about that a little bit with Mr. Benson's presentation, but I just wanted to say thank you for uh, what you've done. And the only other question I have, um, we currently we do have a tree giveaway program, but I notice a lot of those trees that we give away are not what you would consider shade trees or trees that really add to the canopy. So can you talk about maybe um, some of the trees that we should be prioritizing on that tree giveaway that would really help to uh, encourage the canopy? Um, I think a range of trees is, is good. So you will want your big shade trees like your live oak, which can grow to be 120 feet wide, right? But not every yard can, can handle that, right? So having a range of the big trees that provide, the, the workhorses providing the canopy, and the smaller trees that can still provide some level of benefit, but no, not all the disservices we were talking about, like raising sidewalks and stuff, that's a nice mix to have, you know? Because you want the, essentially the biggest tree you can get on your property, which differs from house to house, right? Um, so having that whole range is good to have. Some other things to obviously consider are the, the suitability of those spe different species for storms, uh, for certain conditions. Mm -hmm. You know, the mantra of right tree, right place, you know, that you've probably heard before. It's, you know, there's a tree for every situation or not, but you've got to choose it carefully. You know, you don't plant a live oak under a, under a power line, you know, but you can plant smaller trees under a power line as long as there's nothing under the ground that it's going to affect. So you got to really look at the big picture mm -hmm. and then make the right selections. I think you can educate people, though, on the benefits of big trees at the same time because people see the flower, and that's a hard one to fight. You know, people like that flower. So. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. 
Councilman Carls. Yeah, thank you. Um, several questions and comments. Um, <clears throat> you, you talked about the possibility of public engagement or speaking to the public. Um, did, and pardon my ignorance, but did, did you all, um, did, did the city pay you all to do this and is there an additional budget we need or is there, is, is that included in whatever the proposal was? We, we, yes, we are under, we did, we do have a contract with the city and we have, USF has sort of a technical services contract where the city can ask us, anyone at USF, not just me, um, to do things and then we, obviously we've been working with UF forever so we always work together uh, on this project. I, I don't, I wouldn't say we're making money per se, <laughs> but you know, the people are students and you know, the, the people doing the work are, are getting paid. But is there a budget, and thank you all for doing it, is there a budget uh, for, for public engagement on this? Um, no, unfortunately, because I think they have my cell phone number. So, no, I, we're, we're, I live in the city. Um, and I have an extension appointment, which is public outreach. I have to do it for my job. So We enjoy doing it. We're, we, okay. don't, we don't pay attention to that aspect. Of and then the could, could you all go back, um, whoever's running the slides, could you go back to the one that shows the timeline, please? Um, if you put the slides on. And, and while, while you're doing that, I, my understanding is certain neighborhoods, especially in, in uh, South Tampa, uh, during the bicentennial, 1976, people planted a lot of trees. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see, you, you don't have the That's 80s lot, numbers, but. Um, yeah, well, <clears throat> sorry. There we go. Yeah, there you go. Um, but you can see a jump from 73 to 95. And I wonder, do you all have any idea how many, were there a lot of trees planted then? So there was two, two things happened. I don't know how many trees that were planted, but a couple things happened that might be related to this. We can't say with certainty by any stretch. There was obviously the first ordinance, tree, tree protection ordinance in 1973, uh, but there was also the development of New Tampa. And if you look at some of those old aerial images, you see a lot of New Tampa was um, rangeland or just sparsely treed forests and so as those areas developed people planted trees in their neighborhood and that led to a large canopy so th there's two factors that might have to have to do with that yeah. so so my biggest questions are around <clears throat> the why and where you said South Tampa in particular got hit and I know there's some members of the public that are very interested in in this topic but um, 2000 if you look it, the peak was in this list anyway it was 2011 and then there was a drop about halfway through the decade and then a, another drop again. Um, so, and, and although on a numbers basis, it's not big, it, it's a, a worrying trend. Um, you showed the heat map. Um, uh, do, you, do you know why during that same period, I, I don't know if there's a correlation, but during the same period, uh, there, the neighborhood leaders came out and said there was uncontrolled growth, an uncontrolled approval of massive um, apartment complexes, especially south of Gandhi. Um, some of the places that have been covered with trees got torn down. Um, um, people complain about McMansions going in. Um, but is there any correlation with, with um, specific kinds of development that may have caused that? Um, we, one of the pieces of information that's sort of missing from this analysis, and hopefully the city will work towards acquiring it, is we would like to go back and look at um, where de specific parcels where development has occurred, where tree permits were issued, and, and find out, you know, when you redevelop, obviously in South Tampa there's been a lot of redevelopment, which is not normal. Um, sometimes that requires removing a tree, but it might also re require planting a tree. The real question to answer is, in, over time, uh, the planting of trees gonna make up for that canopy loss? And that's, that's some data that we don't have, um, through the permit system without quite a bit of work. I think they'll probably address that. So maybe, um, Stephen, we can talk about this offline, but I would be in very in favor of doing any more a, a data analysis we could. Could you go to the, the heat map also, please? <clears throat> I mean, the biggest drop was in South Tampa, and um, but you're showing kind of the Beach Park West Shore area. Is that am I looking at that? May, maybe more to the north. In terms, yeah, the closed caption. You keep, keep <laughs> going over the hard part of that slide. So, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, there's there's different areas. This is this is by block just group. Just south of Gandhi, I know you can see that area hit also. And you see on the on the, on the right side um, that there's you know lower canopy. It's sort of a real tight correlation between low canopy 
higher heat. Yeah, this, this slide is the coverage, though, not the decline. But what I think the information that you're referencing is addressed in the analysis of the changing canopy by land use uh, and zoning district, which we have. And while the, like, the large apartment complexes and the commercial projects um, might seem like a lot because they are in terms of density and, and development scale, in terms of land area, like where is the most development going by land area, it's the single family residential. And that's what was reflected in the, their analysis is it's the RS50, the RS60, single family lots. But do we know a direct correlation with the trees being torn down then? Yeah, yeah because that's where they showed decline was okay. in those land use categories. Yeah, and just from a, from a political point of view or policy point of view, I could say, um, you know, if you look at those dates, most of that decline happened in the prior administration, not during this city council and this administration. And, and at least anecdotally, we've been very pro uh, smart growth, um, not uncontrolled growth, and we've been in favor of um, pre preserving trees. I understand the mayor also made an announcement yesterday on planting more trees, which is a good idea. Let me, one last question. Um, some, uh, I, I used to live in Singapore, which everybody is tired of me saying, but um, some folks that are tree advocates say that, um, that there's an international ranking that showed us ahead of Singapore even on, on tree canopy. Is that right? Or where do we stand internationally? That was the if MIT, you, yeah. yeah, I mean, I could explain this. Um, in the short story <laughs> is that the per, I'm friends with the person who did the Treepedia and that analysis. <laughs> it's based on Google Street View images. So sort of looking at green, greenness from a ground level perspective. And so they didn't analyze every city in the world. They only analyzed a handful. And the only reason they analyzed Tampa was because I asked them to do that. Um, I also asked them to analyze other cities. Um, so in that, in that list of cities, um, tr Tampa definitely is number one in terms of canopy. So I don't want to take away from the good news. Um, but you know, if we look at other cities, I think Tampa's canopy is rather rather on the high level so yes. we have we, i mean europe european cities would love the canopy we have in the city yeah, yeah. yeah it's something we we're proud about people talk about it all the time we talk about it it's one of the it's the reason why i bought a house on my street and you know how streets with lots of trees are the are the ones that people like more than the architecture um just uh related to that though um i, I think we need a a tree vision um i i talked to the tree advocates about this too we need to for, for sure protect tree canopy, but we need a vision for what the city could look like in the future. Uh, the, the, the founding prime minister of Singapore back in the 60s um, personally went through and picked species and, and, uh, and, and plant, helped work with his folks on planting it. Uh, but uh, the next prime minister, when he came to Tampa, um, we were going down 275 from downtown to um, the airport. And if you take the road from Singapore airport to downtown, it's completely covered with trees. Uh, and it's a wider highway than 275, but it, it completely is covered with tree canopy. And when we took the Prime Minister of Singapore down 275 here, we had to talk to him to distract him so he wouldn't look. And I wish we could have a vision like that. Bayshore now, the trees are getting large enough that it's starting to provide some canopy. But I think we need to really push this to the next level and think about not just the numbers and replacement, but think about strategically how do we how do we build the kind of canopy that will bring the average temperature down, uh, pr make us resilient, and create the kind of livable environment that people want to live in? Nowadays, economic development is no longer about recruiting companies. It's about creating a livable environment where the best people want to live. And that's we've seen a lot of those folks move here the last few years, and they won't stay, and more won't 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 move. Our kids won't move back unless we have great neighborhoods. Thank you. Councilman Miranda. your a 10 percent increase in canopy can reduce the heat by three to 32 percent but you don't tell me what 10 percent is that, if you would explain it that way the public could understand 10 mm -hmm. percent of a dollar we know it's mm -hmm. what it is so that's a that's that's not our result that's a sign this the science the literature people have done this just in general a 10 percent increase in tree canopy can can lead to this range of improved benefits right and, and we realize that and appreciate it. What you've done is fantastic. 
But even then, when you, you if I, any one of the seven was to go give a speech, 10% of something, they're gonna say, well, what is that, to, what is that something of 10%? I don't know what to tell them, two trees, 10,000 trees, 5,000 trees, mm -hmm. I don't know. So <coughs> if you can it's maybe beautiful. somehow give us that information so we can, when we talk to someone, we can tell them what it is. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. we don't, we don't want to look like we don't know what we're saying. Yeah, yeah, we, we've been and, playing around. Uh, yeah. the, uh, and, and you mentioned something that was really, really to point. When you say you plant them under, you used to plant them under the what? Utilities. Utility lines. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why the utility lines, sometime back 10, 15 years ago, somebody got the idea somewhere and they got a permit. I guess that they were told to do that. And anything there's a line, instead of you seeing a tree, you see a tree that looks like a slingshot holder. It's, uh, mm -hmm. the, the center of it is missing, which yeah, is yeah. most of the, of the coverage that it had to start with. So I don't blame anyone. I blame something that had to be done, I guess, to save the possibility of a high wind or some type of hurricane coming by and really creating havoc. But it's incumbent of us that even the tree canopy that we pass, and we say you gotta have so many trees, and there's where the city comes in about what happened to those trees, where they planted, how many of the ones that were planted are still going strong, mm -hmm. and of those strong, how many years are they gonna to take to replenish? I can see, you know, I look at things realistically, I think I do anyway. And when you see one tree that's so many years old and you have 10 trees coming up, how long is those 10 trees or 20 trees that are going to replace that one equal to the sum to the digit of what that one's doing for the calculating instruments that you gave us? And those are things that I don't know. And, and somehow we could get a report on that, and I'm not asking you or anyone who can do it. I think it would be very informational to tell the public. And we have to shore up our own information when we do things because we passed things in the past and I'm talking about 10, 15 years ago that the haven had swales. You had to have a swale to hold your own water. Well, that's fine. But now you kept it and your wife kept it. But now you sell the house and the one that comes in doesn't know about the swales. Mm -hmm. They just see them there as a nuisance and they want to plant flowers. What's the first thing they do? Mm -hmm. They cover the swale. <laughs> what happens then? You have flooding. So these are the things that we have to come up with a solution that when we put something in the books so that when you do a study, when you sell the house, mm -hmm. it's recorded somewhere that the swales are part of the sale, mm -hmm. somehow. And these are the things that we're gonna work through to, to make sure it's done. And I'm very appreciative. I've been in contact with the, the godfather of trees, that was Joe Chalura. He's a very good friend and he really hit, hit the spot on this here regarding the oxygen that gives out. The, the, the benefits are just enormous. So when you say that the Hispanics in the African-American area are the ones that are in need, there's a very easy solution. Am I right, Mr. Goods? The solution is that the tree is very inexpensive until you come to prune it. Mm -hmm. And now you can't afford to prune it. Now you have a problem with your roof, now you have a problem with the sidewalk getting up, and that's the problem where they don't plant trees. It's an economical thing that we cannot afford. Mm -hmm. Notice I said we. So these are the things that have to be worked on somehow, if not, we're gonna get trees in some areas and mostly not in others. And that's not a good thing either. Yeah. So thank you very much for your report though. We got a lot of work to do and I, th I think you're gonna find some seven, 14 ears, that's two times seven is still 14 to listen to you and come up with a solution to, to have uh, not the ranking maintained number one, but be superior in the ranking of number one. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just one, one thing to add, um, the, you mentioned tree growth and measuring how fast it grows. That was actually one of the things that we did do for this report is looked at the, the 20 years of on ground measurements. and Yeah, and I think another thing to note is when you have a big tree like on your property, that thing's kind of like the lottery winner of all the trees. How many millions of acorns never germinated? How many hundreds of thousands of seedlings got mowed over? And these things made it, you know? It's a numbers game. And when you lose that, you can plant a bunch of trees, but there could there'll still be attrition over the 30, 40 years it's gonna to take to get back to that size. So, and we try to account for that. Any other questions? I just have one, and, and Councilman Miranda touched on that. Back in 1948, when this was all starting, your, your surveys, there's different ages for different type of oak trees. Mm -hmm. Have the 75 years since have a lot of these oak trees that were planted in 1948 have now outlived their expectancy or got diseased or got rot or were blown over by storms. Are these the type of trees that we need to replace that have now gotten up there in age? 
So yeah, every tree has like a functional lifespan. And I think the one that most people assume, like think about when they think about that is like a, a laurel oak, right? Like they, they like a hundred years is, is a good age for that. It's a fast growing tree that grows fast, dies young, right? Um, but you know, every tree is different and the best sense of whether or not, I mean, those kind of things help with managing larger populations, but the best, way to assess the future of your tree is to look at the one in front of you and see how healthy it is. And that takes a professional, which not everyone has the resources for. But, you know, not, there's no magical cutoff age for, for a tree. You know, if it's in good condition, it's gonna persist for another 10 years probably, because trees don't do anything fast. <laughs> They're on their own pace. Well, was, was some of this loss for a tree canopy due to these trees that were planted 75 uh, years ago dying off? There's gonna be a lot of things in there. Yeah, but I would say that, you know, the age of the neighborhood, um, if, if they invested heavily in the laurel oak, like that would be one of many explanations for why there'd be a decrease there. Um, I would say things like hurricanes, but we see that it's regional, you know, in the, within the city, it's not across the city. So, um, it, that indicates that there's something going on in those areas differently, which could be age in the trees that were planted 50 years ago, you know, or development. And the good news is I don't think people are planting laurel oaks uh, anymore. So it's live oaks are the ones that live long, not laurel oaks. But then now comes my next question. There are no bad trees. There are some invasive species that I wish weren't around here, but there are no bad trees. However, a palm tree is grass. A crepe myrtle is going to give us the canopy that we want. However, those are the two biggest trees that are planted in our residential areas. Would it be more advisable for us to ask mandating more of the oak trees be planted instead of those and new and new construction? I mean, I think the bigger the tree, the more benefits, right? Uh, you just need to have the site that can house that again. So like if you shoehorn a bigger tree into more compact development in five, 10, 15 years, you will have sidewalks lifting and things like that, which um, may be problematic, right? And, and we've seen whole developments remove like a thousand trees at a time in like Pasco County because of things like that. So sometimes the palm and the crepe myrtle are the, the only tree for the site that they've been given. And it's not much of a tree, as you said, you know? So if, if there's enough space, yes, the biggest tree, the better. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. Any other questions? <clears throat> a couple things. So we have more on this item, if that's all right. Go ahead. Uh, this, uh, Thank you for the report. This, just want to um, reiterate, this is a cyclical process. So the step that we're at now is to release the report formally to the public. We will be hosting a meeting um, most likely in June to go into a lot more detail. It's probably gonna be a lot longer presentation. Answer questions. And then um, as part of the natural resources process, we take the information that we have back to the natural resources advisory committee. The committee last met last year uh, to, uh, it, it was really reinvigorating the committee because it had been dormant for some time. And at that time, the, the committee decided they did not want to meet again until there was data to review. So now that we have this data, we can reconvene and determine what next steps should be. Um, the purpose of that committee is to use the management plan to look at the data and reprioritize what to actually do next based upon what is the most efficient and effective use of resources. What's, what's, the, what's most likely going to get us back to where we want to be with the resources that we have and with resources that we need. So um, that group is still active and that is, that is the next step in the process is to reconvene them, uh, have their recommendations go through the internal technical uh, working group and then bring that back forward um, as a resource or, or a, budget, a budget request. So um, the next portion of the presentation is the uh, responses to the motion regarding the tree trust fund. Um, so we'd like to, uh, Sharisha and I are gonna talk about the money coming in and the money going out. Um, and then some of the answer some of the questions that you had about the details, if that's all right. Councilman Carlson. Yes, sir. Steve, I just want to ask a quick question about what you just said. Yes, sir. Um, since half the decline was between 2011 and 2016, was there anything done in 2016, like what you're talking about doing? Was there any proactive plan that was put in place to try to, to ch change the direction of it? And do we know whether that those things worked or didn't work? We, we used the management plan. That was what was adopted in 2014. Um, and the management plan is, is enormous and has pretty much anything you could possibly think of in it. The data is used to help us focus on which of those action items 
uh, need to be pursued. Um, I know that there were some policy changes that were made, I think in 2019, uh, in terms of the uh, process to remove trees on single family lots. Uh, the tremendous program I know has gone through changes since that time. So there, there have been both policy and also programmatic changes since that time, but uh, I, I can't really point to one thing that would have been, that would have been triggered by the date, just not off I'm just curious to see if, if, there was, if there was a plan at that time and the, if the plan didn't work because the numbers kept going down, um, just so we could learn from whatever that process was. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. So if we could bring up the second presentation, please. Oh, there we go. Okay, so the, the tree trust fund, uh, the purpose of the tree trust fund is to house the monies that have been brought in through permits. Um, the methodology for how funds are collected it is not a one-to-one -one ratio. It's not, if you take down one small tree, you have to put back one small tree. If you take back one big tree, you have to put back one big tree. Um, the, the, the trees that you put back are all based on the same size tree. They're all based on two and a half inch caliper trees. So if you're taking down one small tree, you put back one small tree. If you're taking down one large tree, you put back multiple small trees. Um, the purpose of the fund is for people that cannot either fit it back on their property or um, are not, not able to do so for some other reason to actually pay in lieu the cost of those small trees that they would have had to plant back. So that's why we refer to it as mitigation. It's not a penalty, it's not a fine, it's mitigation and it has to be directly proportionate to the cost of the tree that they are required to put back, but not the tree that they're taking out. Um, that is the most important thing to remember when it comes to the fees and why they're there and, and how they're developed or determined. It's a scientific process. Uh, Brian and his uh, team of arborists throughout the city um, all work to facilitate this process, but um, you are required to place back trees based upon the method. That is, that is the standard. If you cannot do that, you have to go through a rezoning, or you have to go through a variance to get permission to not put back that tree, but then that is when the fee is triggered to pay instead of putting the tree back on the property. Um, there are two sets of tree funds. There is the, we call it the old tree fund or the big bucket tree fund and then the new tree fund. The old tree fund uh, existed prior to 2019 when the, the ordinance was changed and the new tree fund is what's currently um, in place. So this is what the current tree trust fund requires. As funds come in, they're deposited into a, a sub fund within the new fund based upon the planning district in which they were collected. Um, the reporting to report on the expenditures from the fund is tied to the code change in 2019. It's tied to the new buckets that are based upon planning district. Um, we are currently not spending money out of these buckets. The reason why is because we still have money in the old fund based upon the old code change before it changed, and that is where the funding is coming out of for the programs that Sharisha is going to be talking about shortly. So just to be clear, there are two funds, uh, and this is the current fund. Uh, before 2019, the old fund, it was just one citywide bucket, and the rules and the reporting and all of that was, was different. All of that did change in 2019. So when we report to you, you'll see a citywide fund that the number is only going to keep going down, and then you'll see the new fund, which is five separate accounts, and that, those numbers will continue to go up until we spend down the citywide fund and start drawing down um, on the new five district funds. So, and this is the code section that, that sets forth those. So. Um, again, there was one funding source before. No new monies are being added to that because that is now sunsetted. And once that is expended, we will switch over to the five new districts. Um, and then now Sharish is going to talk through uh, what the balances are in those districts, what some of the recent expenditures have been from those accounts, um, and then we'll switch over to some of the, the uh, initial steps that we're taking for how we're going to be spending down some of these uh, some of these monies. So I'll pass over to Sharisha. Sir, good morning, Sharisha Hills, Director of Parks and Recreation. All right, thank you. So as Stephen mentioned, here is uh, the current balances for the tree trust funds. Um, so as he said before, the fees collected, and, and it's in bold here, are mitigation for the tree removal uh, on public and private property. This money is limited to the selection, acquisition, installation, and maintenance. So as of this month, here are the funds. So when he says the old trust fund, so 2019 and prior, 778,000, and then the breakdown of each bucket or district, if you want to call it, uh, is listed there. Uh, recent expenditures will go through here. So between individual tree plantings, which is the free tree program, the tremendous, uh, tremendous tree, 
uh, also parks projects that we work with Keep Tampa Bay Beautiful and other projects that are in there, as well as the analysis and planning um, support that is here is a current breakdown. And these are just the most recent, not total, but just recent. And then one of the motions was to break down the tree plantings per quarter and per year. So we went back to FY22 and there's your breakdown per quarter with the total of over 2,000 trees planted in fiscal year 22. Um, on your right is your bubble diagram that's showing you the different types. So whether it's tremendous trees, partner plantings, or through our planning and design team, uh, which plants out in our parks and right-of-ways, which I mentioned before. And then these are just the first two quarters. So thus far in FY23, uh, you see the breakdown of what we have, which is over 1,200 trees um, so far. Um, and so that is our current pl plans, what we have, plantings where we're at. And then I will bring... So Wit is going to uh, say a few words about some of the next steps and suggestions that, that staff has come forward with. Um, and then after Wit, I believe we have um, our TTAG partners here. So uh, we'd like to save some time at the end for them to come and speak to you as well about their input. Uh, good morning, Council. Whit Raymer, Sustainability and Resilience Officer. So, um, you know, the parks team, the tremendous team, they do an incredible job uh, getting trees out. Um, but, but clearly, there's still a lot of work to do. So, yesterday, the mayor um, announced uh, a new strategic initiative called Trees for Tampa, with a goal of planting 30,000 trees. Zoom out. Let's see if I can. I do that. Zoom. Oh, that's in. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Councilman. Um, so, you know, I, I think uh, per, uh, Professor Landry mentioned... I, excuse me, I'm sorry. With IT, can we have it on our monitors here up on the dais? Mentioned um, kind of Thank this you. threshold in biodiversity with 30 by 30. This is also a federal initiative to preserve 30% of uh, conservation area by the year 2030, and we thought that was a really good goal. We obviously want to be above that 30% threshold of urban tree canopy, but we like the kind of alliteration here of 30,000 trees by 2030. So uh, Tremendous does a couple hundred trees a year. Um, Brad Suter's team and, and planning uh, and design uh, do kind of planned big mobility projects, also some partner plantings, but there's a lot of room in the middle there that we were kind of missing. And so um, the mayor has kind of um, uh, suggested this six part strategy, which dovetails into the urban management plan and kind of reprioritizes things. So I just wanted to uh, lay out a couple of those for you. I, I, I mean, I am so eager to go plant trees, but I have to tell you, you know, uh, our tree experts in the house, our arborists, they say wit, you've also got to focus on maintenance. I mean, you ask part of the loss is from growth and development, part of the loss is from age of the canopy, and I really think the third thing is that we have kind of taken a hands-off approach to maintenance in a lot of ways and been a very kind of preservationist type of, of community where we didn't even have the funds or we didn't have kind of the, the public understanding of the importance of maintenance, and our arborists and our experts are really trying to bring that forward and say, a tree is just like any other asset that a city owns, a pump, a pipe, a car that has to go in for that uh, periodic maintenance. We've got to take better care of the canopy. And so we're really going to work to find ways to increase the maintenance. And that might mean spending down the tree trust fund, general funds, and of course, the historic federal investment in the urban tree canopy to the tune of $1.5 billion, which the city will be actively applying for. So maintenance is really important. Continuing the mayor's tree giveaway, we have six varieties of trees this year. I can tell you, um, I forgot who asked, but but this uh, idea, Councilwoman, um, about what, what types of trees people want. We had four types of trees last year for the 1,000 tree giveaway. The first 230 trees that people wanted because it was first come, first serve were red maples. And, you know, I, I don't know what it was, but live oak was the last thing that people wanted. And that was that maintenance piece. They don't want to rake. They don't want the maintenance cost. So we're trying to offer a variety of trees, but it's right tree, right place. No wrong tree, really, unless it's an invasive. Uh, but we're, we're really trying to provide a variety of options. We are going to make an internal policy change. Sherry Mullins and her team at Tremendous is an incredibly high-touch, high-engagement program. She comes. She spends time with you on your property. She looks at where the best place to plant is. And uh, we've been limiting that program to two trees, but with Sherry there on your property, if you've got the ability to plant five, let's do it. So we want to put more trees in the ground through Tremendous. Uh, we want to increase the strategic planting places, stormwater ponds, remainder parcels, uh, working with um, community associations, civic associations, who just yesterday 
Finally, we were able to deliver a promise that was made to the Davis Island Civic Association. They've been talking about trees on their trail and in the village area. And so the green team, the AmeriCorps green team is out on Davis Island right now, planting trees at, at the request of the Civic Association. We wanna be able to do more of that. In addition, kind of these neighborhood plantings where the city will work with neighborhood associations that want to get together on a Saturday, we'll drop trees, we'll bring in uh, help with the green team and, and neighborhood leaders, and we'll help each other plant trees on private property and on rights away where it makes sense. Um, and possibly looking at a voucher program, working with local nurseries, similar to the e-bike program that we did where you can go into a lottery and kind of any point in the year, you might be able to, to get a tree and take that to a local nursery that we've worked with and get a native tree so you can take it back and plant it yourself. And then finally, and I know our TTAG uh, folks will be happy about this, is to really enforce the laws and maximize fines where appropriate. Now we know some sometimes uh, people take town trees accidentally uh, or, or, or um, they, they didn't know the rules, but the, the, the cases that we know some nefarious activities going on, uh, just like we did with the South of Gandhi uh, or the Gandhi Boulevard um, uh, $250,000 fine, we're gonna continue to make sure that we are maximizing those fines and enforcing those as appropriate. Of course, that's ultimately up to the magistrate, but we really wanna take a hands-on approach there. So um, those are just a couple of the ideas that we have. Thank you. Councilman Hurtak first, and then Councilman Goose. Um, Thank you, all three of you, for um, this fabulous presentation to talk about the things that we're doing for trees. This gets me very excited. Love trees, and I love that we're going to start focusing on them. I believe the mayor talked about a new tree czar, and I didn't hear about that. Is that? We're still working on whether that would be a, a new position or kind of reinvigorating staff that we have. Um, we, we need we need more capacity internally to help uh, take ownership of this and we're exploring that through the budget right now okay because i can tell you um that that is what i'm hearing from the public <coughs> is that they really want someone who's just focused on trees so i think we'd get a lot of public support for a role like that um <clears throat> Uh, I think the red maple thing was funny only because I have a maple next to my house, not in my yard, but in my neighbor's yard, but I end up with the leaves that are gigantic. So I think that's very funny that people would rather have a maple than an oak I because I think those leaves are much worse. But um, uh, I really love the idea of working with right tree, right place. Uh, and that's something that we might, um, it sounds like we have one wonderful person who can do that, but that's just not enough for a city of 400,000 people and with the, with the amount of land we have. So I would love, again, to be able to focus more on doing that because that's what I see a lot of um, the deferred maintenance on the trees. So I'm really glad we're, we're talking about that, especially in public areas. You'll see the trees dying, falling, and maybe if we had, had dealt with that earlier. And so I'm really happy to hear that. So hopefully when we look at parks, um, I think of parks I go to almost daily or pass by on, on, on drives and seeing trees decline. And now that's great that we're going to be able to deal with that uh, right away. Maybe take that tree out, put a new one in, whatever it takes. Um, one thing that when I talked to the public, they, they mentioned is that, and uh, Stephen, you, you talked about this, was, was the cost of, of putting of paying for trees that go into the tree fund. But from my understanding, it's a set cost. I believe it's 300 per tree. It's 300 per mitigation tree. Yes, yes. So per replacement tree, not yeah. per tree that you're taking out. So if, yes. if your replacement trees, you have to do like 10 of them. Yeah. It's per then it's, all 10. Exactly. Yeah. But what I'm hearing now is that you can't buy a tree for $300. Um, so we have got to change that. Uh, cost not necessarily to make it static but maybe to increase it with inflation over time or something like that because what i'm hearing is that 300 dollars is just simply not enough to cover not only the cost of buying a new tree but for maintenance of it uh it's not that i want to increase costs for folks but if we aren't getting that one for one that this entire thing was planned to do then then it's then then we're losing in the in the grand scheme and so that that worries me a lot actually so i would love to see what we could do to increase that to what is appropriate i don't know if we just every year look at particular costs i mean 
people that would be wonderful to, to look at and see in the budget how we can do that. Um, that tree committee shouldn't meet twice a year. That They should be meeting monthly. Yeah. And we should be having people who are committed to wanting to meet monthly to talk about this. Um, and, and I think uh, that there are enough people in this community that would be thrilled to partake in that if, if the current members can't, can't fit that in. So I would, uh, I would advocate strongly for a monthly tree um, meeting. Um, also, I would love, I, I really appreciated knowing where the trees are going, but I'd love, um, or that we are planting them, but I, I would love a map of where we're planting them, even if it's just a heat map. Uh, I mean, preferably it would be an actual place that they're being planted, but, but just a, a heat map of where these trees are going and the types of trees we're planting. Um, whether also in, in residential and public spaces, because now that we have this uh, amazing ability to zone in that, that the UF and USF uh, folks brought us, we should be able to be tagging where we're planting, what we're planting. Um, and, and I think that would be very valuable in the future going forward. Uh, and I, oh, uh, and my, my biggest, biggest, biggest issue overall is it's great that we're encouraging people to do this and we're having people put in mitigation trees, but then that, um, if you put a new house on a lot and you had to take out a big tree and you're putting in two trees or three trees to replace, when you sell that house, those people do not know that they cannot cut those trees down. So I see it in my neighborhood, I, I've heard about it in other neighborhoods where these trees are being cut down because people don't want them, not realizing that they cannot cut them down. It is not their, it's not a choice. Uh, and so I'm, I'm quite concerned about that. And so what kind of programs, um, I think this sort of goes along with what we're gonna be talking about later about the drainage ditches. They're basically the same idea, how do we, educate the public that they do not have the right to change water mitigation, tree mitigation type issues in a, in a positive way. So that, that is, I think, the much, much larger issue in, the, in going forward. I love these tree things, but how do we really let people know that when they purchase a property, whether it be a brand new house or when it's sold, that they can't just cut down a tree, even if it's small? Yeah, re removal of a mitigation tree is a zoning violation. Yes. So that is, you can call code enforcement. I mean, it is, it is definitely not permitted. Yeah. Yeah. But, but how, do we, how do we educate people on that? Yeah. Um, I don't want the first time people hear that to be a punitive spot. Um, I don't know if it's something we can add with, uh, you know, the thousands of signatures you have to do when you buy a house, or if, it's, if there are some particular tags we can put on a tree. I know there are labels and things like that that just say that can be, you know, mitigation tree or maybe it's a once a, you know, year reminder somehow. Um, like right. how are other places doing this? Right. Because the mitigations, what is going to save us from going down to um, 20, I guess it would be 8% next time we have this report. So we want to at least be able to stay at 30 if not go higher. Thank you. Councilwoman, if I, if I may just respond to two of your, your suggestions. Um, one of my, I just can't go this presentation without mentioning that, that we have probably one of, in, in my opinions, uh, one of the best urban foresters in the country on staff, Eric Mewkey. And he wakes up every Monday morning, he sends a report to staff showing all the tree emergencies he's responding to. So their staff right now is always responding to city trees and rights away that have fallen over the weekend. And that's what a lot of our resources are going to. So Eric does a great job compiling a lot of data that I think you may be happy to share with you all. Uh, also, I know that um, Tremendous does have a map that, that uh, shows every tree that the Tremendous program put in. But again, um, you know, I think that we can do a better job with data and a lot of the federal money is really focused on surveying your, your trees and being able to, to bring that data. I know the TTAG group has really emphasized the importance of that as well. Thank you, I appreciate that feedback. That's great to hear. Goods. You know, I, I look at the reports. It's a great report if you're a tree lover. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm up front guy, you know, and I got some trees in my house that, that I, I wish I could cut them down. I can't, I'm not a tree guy. But I'm, I'm up front, and I look at what Mr. Miranda said earlier. So you have to look at, and I didn't see the study, and I, I, I didn't see it in East Tampa when you talked about dollars. So everybody else. When you talk about communities, 
I see certain communities that love trees. That's, that's the beautification, that's the, the obvious. But you go other communities, trees aren't their concern. I didn't see that in your study. When I look at the trees in certain communities, they call my office all the time. The trees have cracked my, 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 my sidewalks in front of my house. The tree is falling down on my house because it's on the right of city right away and half of my yard, but the city won't come out and we can't do nothing about it and the tree falls on their house. Then they call me about that, Mr. Miranda. So let's get to the bulk of what, if, if you're going to do a project, let's be inclusive of the whole project, not three-fourths of the project because you're missing that big portion that poor people or middle class people can't afford to cut a tree down. That's why I implemented a tree grant needs stamp because they can't afford it. And when you talk about communities, when they call somebody because a tree is rotten, well, where's the arborist at? You know, if I call somebody like Ms. Jones over off of 43rd Street and Clifton, it called me just about every day about that tree in her yard, or we call Tico. I don't hear Tico in this presentation. I get calls all the time about trees and wires. You know, they can't get a tree cut down because the tree is going through the Tico wire, and now forestry, somebody else can't touch that tree unless Tico come out. See, there's a lot of other mechanics in this thing here that we ain't even much talked about. And, that's, and when storms come, I mean, that's 90% of the problem we have because Tico lines or Verizon Weber are embedded in the trees, and then they fall on the road. Now I got power lines down. See, I, I mean, we're going to do a study. Let's, let's, let's be complete with the study because I didn't see anything relating to that. Uh, Councilman Goods, I think Professor Zarger is on the line, and she conducted the social and community outreach uh, for the study, and, the, and they did a, an extraordinary job, I think, trying to reach those communities. And if Professor Zarger's on, she might be able to respond to that because that is something that we paid close, close attention to. So I don't know if Sue Ling or Professor Zarger's still on. Um, hello, this is... This is Rebecca Zarger. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if I'm on video or not. Uh, maybe it's just audio. But I uh, wanted to thank uh, the council for the great questions. Uh, I've been following along. I'm, unfortunately, I'm in New York City, so I wasn't able to be uh, there today for the presentation in person. Um, but there's been some great questions and discussions. And uh, Councilman Goods, to your point, I think uh, in, this, in the study, we have... Um, a lot of information about the issues that you were just describing as to uh, information that was shared with us about the risk of trees, particularly uh, in East Tampa, uh, West Tampa, and other uh, neighborhoods in the city where the cost of tree maintenance is extremely expensive. Uh, just to give you an idea of the information we have from the survey, uh, residents in higher income brackets who responded to questions about the expense of tree maintenance agreed that it was expensive. So um, it, it's something that um, is a big issue for participants in the study. Uh, we did uh, present at the um, ETCRP meetings um, and had some, some interviews with uh, residents from, from East Tampa uh, and other neighborhoods in the city where ongoing tree maintenance is a, is a big concern. Uh, and um, we have uh, some some quotes in there in the report about just the issues you were describing. For example, you know, this big storm comes through, a tree branch falls on your house, uh, you're renting and your landlord doesn't come and, uh, and repair it, and you're left with a, a tarp on your roof for uh, months and months. Uh, and so I think um, it, it is, uh, I think, uh, an important finding of the study that uh, tree maintenance, and in particular, uh, supporting tree maintenance uh, it, through uh, the grant program, such as the, the East Tampa uh, program uh, that's being piloted, is something that residents are really interested in the expansion of. Um, and in fact, I think among the 300 plus people who contacted us to talk with us about trees, uh, many of those folks were interested in that program but lived outside the boundaries of East Tampa. So um, they weren't eligible. Uh, so I think there's there's great demand um, for that, and I think that uh, the um, you know the maintenance of current canopy is something that that uh, is an item that residents are are asking for. So um, hopefully that sheds some some light on your question. 
Um, I would like to say too that we are uh, very interested in uh, the public outreach portion of, of this report and really um, finding ways to uh, work with the city to share the information that's in it um, in as many ways as possible um, and also uh, in ways that are engaging uh, for folks. So um, the information is um, accessible and uh, relevant for them. So I look forward to further conversations uh, about that. Well, thank you for the study. I mean, I, I, I pretty much know, know the problem. I just need solutions uh, to the problem. Uh, you know, the East Tampa tree trimming program, I had asked that they have a paid arborist on staff to help out with that problem. We've, we've yet to accomplish that, which I don't know why we have the money to do it, because I believe we only have one or two arborists in our own department here. And we're talking about how many trees we've been cutting in East Tampa, and that's been slowing the process up of getting those trees that are cut because of lack of an arborist. So, I mean, things that you, we have resources to do, we're not doing. You know, I talked about Ms. Jones. I went out to where the guys finally were cutting the tree down. I called Sharisha. She finally got them to get on it. They get on it. Reverend to that lady's house in that tree. And I went out and the guy said, man, we never had a councilman come out with cutting the tree. I said, this lady been ringing my phone for a month. So I don't know if we have enough staff in our forestry department, which I, she's shaking her head, which we cut down years ago. So I think there's only, they've only got one truck, if I'm not mistaken. So you can't do a job. My brother always told me, he says, if you don't have the right tools, you can't do the job. I, I, you know, I had to learn that. I had to learn the hard way. If you don't have the right tools, mm -hmm. you can't do the job. And for the life of me, I say it repeatedly all the time. If we know there's a problem and we know the answer, there is a solution. Be it reallocate money here, or there. Be it get more employees here, or there. But there is a solution. The solution is you need to look at your staff and how you can help the citizens who are taxpayers. To, for the major resources that they're asking for. Not the pet project stuff, but the major resources. And I can tell you, trees are a big issue. If you go in Selfridge Springs, there's a guy. This huge tree fell in the back. It's, it's over by the Hillsborough County Conservative uh, Museum on River, on River Cove. This huge, I mean, it's, this tree is humongous. I guarantee you go by that, that tree is still sitting in this guy's backyard because he can't afford to move it. But I wish I had a CRA or, or tree money because we sure would go and try to cut that tree out this man's backyard. And you might know the guy I'm talking about. It's, I mean, it's huge, humongous. So I'm just saying we have to be kind of smart and look at the resources, you know, that we don't have and find or look at some federal dollars that have an actual program for the whole city that people can call. It, it, it may be a couple of dollars, but something's better enough to help them get these trees cut. Because if you look at it, no one on the east side of town cares about no canopy. I'm just going to be honest with you. No one cares about, they care about, this tree about to fall on my house, the trees are in the power lines, and uh, my sidewalk is breaking up because the city won't come out to cut the tree or remove the tree. And again, you get, we don't have staff, we don't have the money. So I think those are some of the challenges that we need to look at and highlight and outline to deal with those issues. That other tree can that's going to work itself out because those, those folks have the money to do certain things, you know, She's right about the fund is low. You may need to raise those dollars, you know, because it's low. It makes no sense. And look at, you know, revamping, you know, the, the wheel a little bit. So, you know, sometimes you've got to change a, the tire sometimes because the tire gets worn. So I hope that you take heed to some of those Mr. Benson. I won't be here, but I'll come out there every now and then and raise hell about it because I, I just think that we have to be smart about what we do. Thank you. There are no more questions for staff. We have uh, some speakers. I'm going to look to my right and left. Any more questions? I have one. Sir. A tree gets cut down and is mitigated. Someone plants a tree saying, I planted that tree under the mitigation. How are we going to be assured that that tree is going to grow to maturity? Do we have people that go out and check? Are these trees that are planted for mitigation? How are we going to be able to make sure that that tree, that the person says, I planted it in mitigation, I don't know what happened to it. Maybe I didn't water it enough. How are we going to ensure that tree gets to maturity? Right now, um, that, that duty is sponsored with uh, development and growth management, and it's part of the permitting process. There is a permanent, there's a process in the permit where we're supposed to follow up to take a look at the trees once they're planted to see how they're doing and see if they meet the grazing standards. 
uh, because of staffing issues and the volume of permits, we're not able to actually follow up on those. It is something that we discussed in our nat last natural resources uh, group meeting, and it is something that we are looking into. But right now, we don't have the ability or the capacity to do that. So more staffing to make sure these trees grow up to be healthy. All right. Thank you very much. Let's, Councilman Miranda. When we get a tree and it's brought down, and you have the branches and the trunk and so forth there, what happens to the tree that's cut down, that's cut up in, in chunks? It, the reason, that would depend upon the property owner. Yeah, the reason I'm asking that, if we had the ability to have the tools that Mr. Gould was talking about, we could get that same tree on the same property, cut it into shavings, and get it used back for mulch of some sort. Right. Maybe you're doing that. We don't know about it. I don't, we don't know. Yeah, so we, we actually do with our forestry team that uh, removes trees, and you can pick it up free at Laurie Park. So on the north side closest to the nursery, it's, uh, they shave it down to mulch, and it's open to the community to so reuse. So the community can pick it up for free? Yes, sir. Well, that's very good. We yes, didn't, I didn't know that. I'm sure that maybe the other six didn't either. Well, thank you very much. Absolutely. I appreciate you giving me a lesson on it. No problem. Thank you. Can we hear public comment, please? Thank you. Good morning. Linda Saul Senna. Um, congratulations. Welcome. Thank you for being concerned with trees. I just found a, a resolution I'd written for the year 2006, and it listed five things I wanted to accomplish that year, one of which was a tree ordinance. So it's been on the minds of council members for a very long time. It's really about the resources. We've heard a very complete report. I applaud the administration for doing its five-year report, but it's about you all during the budget process and about the administration, and if they don't do it, council needs to do it, to make sure that there's adequate funding for the staff to do, and the equipment to do what we need to do. We are all proud of our tree canopy. We've had a lot of um, information about what it means to us in terms of climate change, in terms of the health and happiness of the people who live in Tampa. It's something that serves our existing residents well. We all know this stuff. Please work hard to find the resources, prioritize our tree canopy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good morning, Council. Uh, I'm Lorraine Perino. I'm the president of the Tampa Tree Advocacy Group. I'm here to introduce our members. We're each going to make a three-minute uh, comment to you about the tree canopy. And um, we're going to start off with Nancy Stevens, Pamela Jackson Haney, and Allison Date. Carol Ann Bennett is out of the state and couldn't be here. Um, so we, we've met with some of you individually, and we hope you uh, are inclined to take our suggestions. I'll speak last. Thank you. I'm Nancy Stevens, and um, yes, I'm one of the founding, founding members of TTAG. I'm speaking under that um, today. Um, and I'd like to thank everybody for the presentations and the work done. And I'd also like to thank the city staff for all the work that you, you guys are doing um, to keep the trees maintained, uh, to help stop illegal tree removals, to plant new trees. The city staff works every day um, hard to do all that. But, all, but sadly, all that hard work's not been enough. As you saw by the tree report, <laughs> Um, we've been, we, our tree canopy has continued to get reduced. If you look at the numbers, um, the total tree canopy in Tampa has decreased, the tree canopy itself has de <coughs> decreased by 13% over the last two years. So it, w the, amount of tree, you know, the amount of tree canopy that is there is 13% lower in the last 10 years. And in South Tampa, that number is even worse. South Tampa tree canopy has been reduced by 18% eight, in just five years. So that, that's a warning to us that says we're, what we're doing is not enough, that we need to be doing more. And so I, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm glad that the mayor's gone out and making a statement and taking, and taking leadership in this area. She made a statement yesterday that had some, a really um, a lot of good ideas, and, a lot, and I agree with her statement that she said, what did she say? Um, we need to act quickly and decisively to replenish our invaluable urban forest, which has decreased over the past decade. So I agree with her wholeheartedly. Um, and now it's time to turn those words into actions. We need a bold vision of what we want to look like and bold, detailed plans of how we're going to get there. 
and as um, I think was mentioned, uh, someone in charge, a tree czar or whatever it might be called, to, to have, that has the responsibility and the accountability to make those plans happen. Because if, if there's no one person in charge, and kind of right now there's a lot of different people doing a lot of different things, but no one person's in charge. We need someone in charge. And then as just mentioned, the funding to do it. The tree, um, the tree trust funds are not, they're not allowed to use the tree trust funds for everything that needs to be done. More money has to be budgeted to do all the things that need to be done to keep our tree canopy healthy, including, um, as mentioned, maintaining the trees. Uh, and, and the trees should be considered as part of a value of our infrastructure, like the pipes, like the roads, and, and the maintenance of it should be prioritized to keep that infrastructure in good shape. Uh, also, protecting the trees, that costs money. And um, unlike a building, a tree can't be torn down and bigger ones planted. A tree, um, old trees have much more value than those new little trees that have been, that get planted. So it's important to protect the ones we have. And yet tree cutters continually remove trees. Fines must be levied on the tree cutters in addition to the, in addition to the homeowner. If you find the tree cutter, that tree cutter won't do it again. So fines have to be levied on the tree cutter. And developers continue to buy land with protected trees on them and then request variances to remove that valuable infrastructure. We must encourage smart development that values both buildings and the trees. Because they, the, they buy those lands, they know those trees are on there. Um, finally, we need to plant more large uh, shade trees. 30 seconds more. Okay, thank you. Um, that's all I have. Now, now more than ever, we need our trees to clean the air, absorb water from the flooding areas, and cool down our city. They need to be planted in our urban, and specifically, we need to um, target our urban heat islands. They need to be planted in public, public places and private properties, and basically anywhere, in my opinion, that they're not blocking the solar panels that we're going to be all out there to produce our electricity. So if there's not a solar panel, it should be a tree. Um, and I. I'm optimistic that working together, um, the city council, the citizens, the mayor, the staff, um, we can do this. And I hope that I'd like to see a strong can a tree canopy, the environmental success of this mayor and the city council. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Pamela Jackson Haney. I want to uh, thank you for allowing us the time to speak with you today about the trees. Um, thank you, first of all, for funding this tree report. Um, thank you so much for all of your comments. You have such a good understanding of what needs to be done going forward, and we really appreciate that. Um, you know, this has been near and dear to our hearts for years. We've been working on this, and the staff is wonderful. They really put up with um, put up with a lot of our questions and concerns, and patiently answer all of our questions. Um, and so I want to say thank you to all of them also. Um, with regard to Councilman Hertek's comment, um, I just wanted to say about the $300 that goes for the mitigation, um, a friend of mine wanted to do the right thing by not just paying into the tree fund um, for two trees, which would have been $600, but they decided, she and her husband, to plant two live oaks on their property in West Tampa, and it cost them $1,660. <coughs> to plant those two live oaks. Um, a huge difference from the $600 that they could have paid into the trust fund. So I applaud people for wanting to do this, but this is something that needs obviously to be fixed. Um, I was fortunate enough to attend church last Sunday, and many of you might have. It was Earth Sunday. The entire theme, music, scriptures, prayers, was all about helping us to be good take caretakers of the earth, good stewards of the earth. The prayer of confession really hit home though. It said, we said, we pursue profits and pleasures that harm the land and pollute the waters, leaving this world depleted and damaged for future generations. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Empower us to be courageous and committed in our care of creation so that we and all of your creatures may know the joy of life abundant. Amen. The latest tree report was bleak and depressing. There's no way around that. But on Sunday, we are encouraged to be hopeful despite thinking all is lost. I'm looking at this report as a time to turn things around now, and the city council has the power to do that. I want to applaud the mayor and the legal department for finding the owner and the tree cutters for destroying those 28 trees on Gandhi at that mobile home park. Huge win. As you know, the fine 
was $234,000 for the tree cutters alone, and it was upheld by the appeals court, so bravo. This should be and must be the blueprint moving forward for illegal tree removals. Many illegal tree removals are happening in our neighborhoods around us every single day. Why? Why can't we get it under control? We know there are many arborists and tree cutting companies who know the rules and follow them, and there are many who don't. Why are they still doing business in the city of Tampa? Can we take away their licenses? The mayor has talked about wanting to do this. Let's explore it. That may seem like a reach, so what can we do now? We can increase the fines and find the arborists and the tree cutting companies who do this illegal work and the dirty deeds. The power to increase the fines is in your hands. I was at the magistrate's hearing last week where a homeowner was fined about $4,000 for carelessly allowing tree cutters to top and effectively kill a grand tree on the right of way and another tree on his property. Some that may think that's steep, many do not. The tree cutters got off scot-free. more. Thank you. Another example, a very wealthy and well-known South Tampa developer took out a grand tree illegally behind me and was charged $8,000 on a lot that sold for $1.5 million. That is not a, even a drop in the bucket for that developer. That's not even the cost of one high-end appliance that's gonna go in that house on that piece of land. It's a measly fine. He should have at least been fined the 15,000 allowed. You have the power to max out these fines now. We wish you would do it. And also try to get those tree cutters. They also need to be fined. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, still morning, almost, yeah. Okay, I'm Allison Date, and um, I uh, am so happy that this is happening, let me tell you. So I've been looking at this a lot lately, and I just wanna say bravo to the people who had the foresight more than 10 years ago to develop this, because they were concerned about the, losing the canopy. And, uh, I don't know the exact numbers, you guys probably do, but it's been, I mean, I think they started the survey before they started this. And so I've been looking at it a lot to try and figure out what's going on, and I talked to one of the, off, the original authors, and I learned a lot about it. It's a, um, the plan is, was due to their concern about the development that was causing loss of Tampa's tree canopy, and it's data-driven, as we saw, instituted by executive order to provide information needed to protect and expand Tampa's canopy. Unfortunately, I think this plan has not been effectively implemented because several important items have been dismantled or never completed. The problem surrounding the use of the tree trust fund is only one example of not completely dysfunction, but like people like now we're finally getting told what it, what, what's involved with it. But that's, all of those things have contributed to the loss of Tampa's tree canopy. That's one of my, that's one of the things I'm thinking. The overarching problem to implementing this, uh, to implementing this strategic plan has been the lack of ongoing monitoring of quantified action steps that are based on clear lines of responsibility. That's hasn't been happening. And this plan requires more adequate funding to build a tree program that sustains the urban forest. It should not rely solely on mitigation or grant funding as it, as it does now for like anything extra. It requires sufficient, sufficient personnel and informed oversight. There was a separate position to monitor, uh, monitor and collect the tree information on a monthly report but that was disbanded along with other personnel and natural resources. And those positions have never been re, um, returned. The Natural Resources Advisory Committee was created to ensure proper implementation, but they haven't met enough, and um, a lot of their recommendations were not enacted, so they haven't been very effective. The Urban Forest Plan states, few activities in the plan are as important as the success of the urban forest man to, for to forest urban management as monitoring, but this step is often overlooked, poorly designed, and underfunded by most cities. I'm looking forward 30 seconds more. 
I'm looking forward to seeing the use of careful monitoring by, of both planting and removal, as well as um, a permanent tree czar position that will be created to oversee the complicated process of establishing accountability. And um, I am really happy that, I, I'm, I'm really glad that we do have this data, because if we didn't, I don't know, we probably won't have any canopies. So thanks to you, and thank you very much for letting me speak. We need to show this on the overhead. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead and place it there. It will come up. No, no. You had it right the first time. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. IT, we need that up on. There you okay, go. Thank you. That. Good morning again. My name's Lorraine Perino. I'm the president of the Tampa Tree Advocacy Group. In May 2019, 28 grand oak trees were illegally removed from a former trailer park in South Tampa. In November 2020, 200 trees were removed from the former Georgetown property. Also in November 2020, City Council approved remove, removing 30 mature oak trees from the Bay Oaks property to build luxury condos. In March 2021, the city allowed a builder to remove a healthy grand oak with a canopy spread of 93 feet in South Tampa, despite the entire neighborhood opposing it. In October 2021, eight grand oaks were removed from a single lot in Ballast Point. <laughs> In December 2022, City Council approved removing 32 protected trees from the Circle C property to build yet more luxury condos. These are a few examples of the wholesale destruction affecting Tampa's tree canopy in the past several years. This map details the destruction. Each red pin signifies a house in South Tampa that has been raised in the past decade, nearly 2,500. The trees on this properties were also destroyed. The recently released 2021 tree canopy and urban forest analysis informs us that Tampa's tree canopy has declined by 4% in the past five years. A closer reading shows that Tampa has lost 7% of its tree canopy since 2016 and 13% of tree canopy since 1995. South Tampa has lost 18% of tree canopy and flood prone Davis Island has lost 10% while its impervious area increased by 5%. If the citywide push for growth and development continues at breakneck speed, by 2026, Tampa will lose another 7% of tree canopy, which will decrease to 28%. For a city with a D air quality rating, the worst in the entire state, and in an age of dramatic climate change and sea level rise, Tampa is on a very slippery slope. <coughs> city Council isn't responsible for destroying all of the trees cited above. The City Council did approve removing 122 trees in two years. An oak takes 50 years to reach grand oak status. A child born today with an oak tree planted in her honor will be 50 years old before all the benefits of that tree become available to her. Yet these are the very trees that Tampa is destroying. Tampa's tree ordinance is 40 years old. In it are tools to prevent such a drastic loss of tree canopy, which are not being utilized. The Tree Trust Fund, for example, is flushed with nearly $3 million, yet it is not being used to utilized to plant more trees. When we tree, Tampa Tree Advocacy Group members met with each of you recently, you stated that you were in favor of protecting the tree canopy. TTAG has pro proposed concrete action steps to protect Tampa's trees. They only need to be implemented. One of the authors of the 2021 tree study compared the recent five-year loss of trees in Tampa to the clear cutting of four Davis Islands. A city tree czar would be a good solution. The mayor says she's in favor. She and city council must work together to fund it. 30 seconds more. People in the know say that, Tampa, that in Tampa, trees always come last. If this disdain by city government towards the health of our canopy continues, all of us Tampa residents will be much the worse for it. Please act now. Thank you. Thank you. See this? Yes. This is, um, see the line across the picture? It's called a BFE. It's the base floor elevation, which nobody's mentioned today. It's part of something that we have to take into consideration in the coastal high hazard area. If you notice, 
that that's quite high. It's probably about this high. Okay, so when these folks are killing the trees in South Tampa, they have to build up that much. So we've seen folks come in here and request, um, did not request to take out trees. Well, when you build something up this high on the roots of the tree, what's it gonna do to the tree? It's gonna kill it. So that's something that has to be taken into consideration. And I also wanna point out that very little of Rattlesnake Point had any trees. Very little of West Shore Marina District had any trees. So those areas didn't have a whole lot of trees to start with. And that's where a big chunk of our building has been done in South Tampa. So you can imagine where all these trees, even though we've taken some of the biggest hit. Um, so I wanted to point that out. Um, I, and, and this gentleman right here said that people don't go out and check on the trees. I'm gonna tell you right now, I've got a Tico lot three times the size of this room that is full of dead trees, dead bushes, because they planted them all, didn't put anything in to water them, and I can't find a human being to, to admit that they will come out and pull up the dead stuff. It's been like that for about six years now. Um, so, but when we raise homes, many of the properties, it, the houses, they, they didn't have trees to start with, but there were very few, and, and we've lost so many big lots. Our commercial lots is what we've lost down there. And so they didn't have trees there. Um, the mitigation trees poorly placed. I have showed some folks on council the poor placement of mitigation trees just in my neighborhood alone that, that could severely damage our neighborhood if they were put in. Now I want to show you this little nifty piece of paperwork right here. I know this is a beautiful drawing for you guys, but this is the Gandhi Civic Center if any of you guys, most of you have been there. Okay, so here's the center. There is an easement that belongs to the city of Tampa to the right. It's a road, it's a paved road. The city of Tampa actually pays the taxes on that paved road because we didn't build it, so they have to. Okay, so we just put in a community garden. I know you guys just talked about this last week um, and, and we were really excited about the community garden. If you guys knew what kind of pain in the butt it is to start a community garden, I just want you to know that it was very difficult. And I know people to talk to, but I'd like to point out to you that we were required to put in a buffer between this city of Tampa road that goes to a lift station that is only driven on by people who are driving big trucks full of poop, okay? But we're required to put in a buffer. And when I asked the folks at the city of Tampa if we, they could donate some trees to us because we don't have enough places to plant all the trees, we were told that we are, the de we are the developer on that, so we couldn't have any trees from the city of Tampa. Why? Not only did I say, hey, we can put some in this buffer, but we have a huge lot, an acre and a half. You guys can put some oaks up here in the front too, but we get nothing. So just take that into consideration. Thank you. Good afternoon, Keila McCaskill, uh, Tampa. I support my T-Tag sisters, uh, uh, yes. like Councilman Goods early, mentioned earlier. In East Tampa, there's not a whole lot of education that happened with trees, right? And so recently I entered an initiative where I, my organization goes in the neighborhoods and we try and help with light tree trimming. I'm not cutting trees, I'm not supposed to. T-Tag, because they got on me about that. Did I check first? So I did. But I wanted to see if there's a way to provide some kind of education outside of T-Tag, because I did request um, Carol and one of uh, t tag sisters to see if there's a way to come into the community to educate but then I would also like to see if there's any resources or opportunities for you all to educate at some of the neighborhood associations at the East Tampa CRA the, and at the partnership either one pick one but to do some education because I learned some of the benefits of the trees you know at first I didn't know I didn't care like he said we didn't care about trees but there is some benefits to the trees and I don't think we know that so I in addition to t tag coming to the CRA or to the meetings in East Tampa, I just want to see if there's any resources that could be coupled with that so that we can be very aware of what we should know about the trees, particularly since we do have a tree trimming grant program and I'm not sure how much educating they're doing while they're trimming, if that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in the chambers that would like to give public comment? Ms. Caroline Bennett, are you on the line? Hi, my name is Carol Ann Bennett. I'm one of the founding members of TTAG. Um, 
I'd like to talk about um, an experiment that was done with the natural resources. Um, the thinking was that if the we had a very centralized natural resources, it was very robust, and Kathy Beck was the head of that. She was, in effect, the tree czar. And um, the thinking was that if they spread the natural resources personnel out to the various departments, that it would be more efficient. Well, I think you can tell by this tree study that that has not proven to be the case. Um, we need to go back to a centralized natural resources. Um, when Kathy Beck retired, her job was never filled. That job needs to be filled. You can call it the trees are, you can call it whatever uh, her title was, but that needs to be filled because there's, you've got all these separate arms that none of them know what each other is doing. There's no centralization, there's no control, there's no oversight, there's no big picture planning and accountability. So we need to go back to our robust um, uh, natural resources. Um, other thing I want to talk about is enforcement. We cannot plant our way out of this problem. We have to enforce the laws that we have. And the Gandy Trailer Park should be the blueprint for that. The, the big fines were leveled on the tree cutter, and that is the key. These people make their living. They know when, when they recently, what Pamela alluded to, they topped a tree that was in a right-of-way. A homeowner didn't know it was in the right-of-way. They know, though, that's how they make their living. You find them, and they're going to stop. That'll stop the illegal cutting of trees. Now that homeowner who didn't know any better is going to have to pay a $4,000 fine plus pay someone to remove that tree. The tree cutter who topped the tree should, have been, should be fined also, and that'll put an end to it. Um, I also want to talk about um, what um, Councilman Goods touched on. Um, he is absolutely right. Um, the low, there needs to be an income-based program to help people maintain, trim the trees, and keep them healthy. The respiratory problems that are in lower-income na neighborhoods is well, well documented. And the best solution to that, one of the best solutions to that is trees. They need low-income areas need trees as much or, or more than high-income areas. Um, and so we need to have the uh, income-based maintenance for, for people like that. And we also, I want to point out that this loss of tree canopy, if you do the math, they said our tree canopy is $17 million. The percentage of that, that's $748,000 um, that we are losing. That is lost money. Even if you hate trees, you don't want to lose that much money. And, and PTAG has three things we want you all to do. We want you to find the tree cutters. We want you to redo the formula for the fine. And we would love to see it become a misdemeanor if that's possible. And I want to say that TTAG has been begging, absolutely begging since 2020 to be put on the Natural Resources Advisory Committee. And we cannot get on that committee. There needs to be more civilians. There needs to be um, uh, better representation. And they need to meet more often. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Benson, does this finish your report? <laughs> Councilwoman Herta, anything uh, you would like to add? Any different motions you'd like to make? Um, not at this time, but uh, thank you so much for this. Um, this is a great presentation, and I look forward to this being the beginning of the conversation. Councilman Maniscalco. Real quick, uh, in regards to the Natural Resources Advisory Committee, can we meet more often? I, as was mentioned, once a month, if not, you know, once every two months. Uh, and as the final speaker mentioned, you know, it's so hard to get on that committee. How big is that board? How do they apply? Uh, how, what is the diversification from the community? From what is it like? We, we can look at some modifications. The last group um, that was appointed uh, has only met once. And there is a there is a term for them, but but if there's a need to add more seats or look at the meeting frequency, we'd be happy to do that. Um, yeah, because there's there's a, a a hunger and a desire for the public to be involved, and um, again to meet more twice a year, I get it. It takes 50 years for an oak to become a grand oak. However, we have, as we've discussed over the last decade and less than that, the decline in the tree canopy. You know, we have so much going on, so much construction, so many new homes, so. You know, we're, we have to stay on top of this. Uh, it, I mean, this is, it's manageable now. We have to stop and we have to make sure we don't see a further decline. 
Um, do you need a, an official motion for, for you to look at this advisory board and, um, or could you just come back with a report or just a, a memo of the makeup and how we can further expand we, it? We can come back with a report on the history of the committee, why it was established, the, the, the makeup of it and the parameters that would need to be modified to change it based how upon your recommendations. Okay. Um, would you like an official motion perhaps for July that you just issue a memo and just give us an update? That, that would, we could. So do. I'd like to make a motion no. that July 13th under staff reports um, that you, Mr. Benson, and your team come back with an update regarding the Natural Resources Advisory Committee and how we can further uh, increase the meeting amounts, you know, meeting times during the year and the makeup of the board and how we can expand that and how we can tweak it and modify it. A written report? Or you want it in person? Let, let's do a written report, and if we need you here, we'll just Thank request. So that's the motion. Thank you. July 13th, under staff reports. We have a motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Goose. Any further discussion? Councilman Carlson. Yeah, just uh, I, I've said this before, but my philosophy going forward would be that uh, boards, ideally, any of these advisory boards would have one representative for each city council member so we get geographic diversity on it. If that means the mayor needs to have more appointees, I don't care. But um, but it would be, I think it would be better represented of the community if all advisory committees have a, had at least one representative from each city council member. Thank you. Councilwoman Hurtak. Um, I'm not going to make a motion right now. I want to talk to you all about the best way to do it. But uh, I definitely want to expand on the idea of the map of where we're planting these and the types of trees we're planting, maybe even adding it to the GIS so people know where it is. I mean, I'm sure that data is sort of available. So like I said, I'll talk to you all about that. We can figure out what the right motion is there and the time you need. Um, and then um, I will also make a motion about coming back to talk about uh, that trees are um, position and where we are on that. So uh, again, I can, I can make that now, but I'll probably make it later. So again, we have that chance to have that conversation. Um, thank you again so much for this. I really appreciate it. Good second. Yes, she did. I already said this, that you either made the motion and good seconded. That's right. All in favor say aye. Aye. Is there any objections? Motion passes. Without objection, we are at recess until 1.30.